Hey. How is hey. everybody? Happy Open Chat Friday. It's awesome to Thank see you. you. Look at what the cat dragged in here. We'll let anybody in, in onto this show. That's right. It's That's unbelievable. Right. It's yeah. good Friday. How you doing, man? Well, I'm doing well, all things considered. You know, yeah? Dot, dot, dot. Uh, what doesn't hurt this morning, Pastor? <laughs> well, I had a hair that wasn't hurting, and I realized it had fallen out. So. <laughs> 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 it's awesome to see you, man. Yeah, yeah we needed yeah. an upgrade. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we needed, we needed somebody to make jokes about is what we yes, needed. That's, right. <laughs> that's why I can never say I'm not good for anything. <laughs> um, it truly is great having you here. Pastor Thank Hal, you. how you doing, my I, dear brother? I'm good for a Friday. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you look, you got a haircut too, it looks like. I got them all cut. Yeah. <laughs> I went to a, a, diff, a different barber lately. They call it a sh shape shot shot, you know. <laughs> well, they really shaped it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will. I had air cut. Nobody even noticed. Yeah, I didn't I notice. Last Thursday, no. Last Thursday, I think. Last Thursday. Oh, it looks. It, it, it almost looks nice. Yeah, you got it in in shape for the podcast. It looks yeah. halfway decent. That's the only gene, Beckermeyer gene that he got that I really envy. envy. <laughs> the hair, the hair. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never forget yeah. back in 2016 when we first got on YouTube, and the first message was a Freddie Bear message, and the first comment we ever got about a message that we Boy, ever did I video. Wear a wig. What they they wanted to know if Fred wore a wig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I love that yeah. joke. Hey, uh, we'll have Brian Ross with us about at about a quarter after. Uh, so I thought we might just jump into the live chat until then. So if if, if you're out there, a, a couple of things. If the, if you're new to the podcast, uh, you can uh, ask us anything about God or the Bible, and we just might have the answer that might, you're looking for. Might, um, might. Thank the, you for qualifying. If you, if you want, you can put a Bible verse in the live chat, and we will do exegesis on the spot. Uh, if Brian's with us, we'll just make him do all the work. And then, um, uh, and then if you if you know Brian Ross and you got a question for him, uh, put that in the live chat. Put Brian in caps so I can see it, and we'll uh, try to try to get that question to him uh, before he's gone at eleven. I got a question. <laughs> You've if, already got. You got a well, question. Well, if somebody then, asks us a question, and we say about a Bible verse and say, I don't know. Is that exegesis? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we're not lying. Yeah. Uh, hey, looky there. We've got John Snodgrass in the hey, house. Hey, brother John. Your beautiful brother. It's awesome to see you. And Damon Chen is here. Damon. Really? He says, happy resurrection weekend to Amen. all the saints and to our mad, bad crew for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most, most miserable. Miserable. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Promised. Promised before the world began. Amen. I talked about that on Sunday. I did. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Yeah. Mm, Christianity amen. 1 1 is why I have often uh, said I think the one hope that we have in Ephesians 4 has got to be Christ Himself. Yes. It's, it, it's not his so much His appearing as it is Him. Exactly. Yeah. And everything that he embodies. Right. So all these different, there's aspects of hope in Paul's epistles, and all of it is centered around mm -hmm. Christ. Yep. Amen. Uh, well, the which reminds me, I've got, I, I have to um, share a couple of things here. Okay. Uh, sure, show. Um, uh, uh, Deborah Johnson. Oh. Our sweet sister. We're just here. She just posted uh, her new April Just a Minute newsletter. Uh, so check that out. She's she's on the ball, mm. uh, and it's fantastic. We'll probably do some uh, and um, dive into it. Maybe do some analysis on Monday. So check that out. I have a new article over at Supply of Grace also uh, on uh, Mystery blah, Babylon. Blah, blah, blah. Our dear brother uh, Joshua Edwards said he read it this morning and it didn't suck. Oh, uh, so it got Josh Edwards as. Um, uh, stamp, stamp of, of approval. approval. That's good yeah. enough for me. Uh, That's like the good housekeeping seal. It's uh, not short, but you know, uh, I, I, if if you're a revelation <laughs> junkie, you know there should be enough 
analysis insight there to satisfy. You know, I've been so, thinking about yeah. writing an article for Supply of Grace. Are you now? You can just give it to me. I'll post it for you. Well, I, 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 what I hesitate for is I don't know how much time you have to edit it. <laughs> no, you want to do an article? I'll totally put one on. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there's work. Josh is uh, working on uh, having uh, Ted Fellows articles and Russ Shepard. We're going to put those two guys on. Uh, we're going to take what they've already done and uh, and post them on Supply of Grace. So check that out. Two great fellows. Um, considering that this is uh, Passion Week, which I love. It's not a tradition in grace that we uh, celebrate Passion Week, but I love Passion Week because I love the stories more than anything. Mm -hmm. And I did last year put together a booklet. It was just a writing exercise for me. Of I called it The Agony of Victory, which is all about – uh, the chronology of events of everything the four gospel accounts said about uh, the Lord's crucifixion, starting with the Garden of Gethsemane. I took all four accounts, put it all into chronological order. Uh, I also incorporated all the times that the uh, prophecy was fulfilled. And then I also have uh, doctors. And it, well, it starts with the Garden of Gethsemane and then the trials, the him going down the Via Dolorosa, and then the, his crucifixion. And in the crucifixion, I incorporate a, a number of doctors explaining what he went through physically when he was on that cross, which is excruciating. All the times prophecy was fulfilled, everything that the gospel accounts had said in chronological order, it's totally epic. Epic. You know, uh, I love this. Uh, I love the. And then I have a little booklet here. So you can download it as a PDF or go through this cute little Oh, flip book. Isn't that good? Isn't that pretty? That is. yeah. It isn't just it got a good content, but it's 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 pretty too. I like pretty. <laughs> so, I remember. So, I re check that out. I'm very proud. Of, this one I'm very proud of. I love I love this book. I remember. It, it looks a little wordy. It is yeah. very wordy. I have no. I know. You know. I'm, 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 one of the last things <laughs> I heard my son Michael play on his trumpet was Via della Rosa. Ah, uh, beautiful. I, lo I love um, I love that song. Via Dolorosa is fascinating to study too. Nobody know really knows what what it is anymore. You've got d differing views now, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Jerusalem has changed so much. Uh, but um, yeah, it was not a short walk. Do you know Don Francisco? The name. He's a um, singer back in the. Oh, maybe I may have seen the name. Uh, did he do a song called Via Dolorosa? He did a song called "He's Alive," and I'd like for you to play it on Sunday. All right, I will try to remember that. Well, well you, you you are getting back an ancient. <laughs> ancient I'll go. I'll yeah. go look under vintage yeah. music for a friend. Yeah. Very vintage. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, this it's all it's all cool stuff. Check that out. Um, uh, we have Carl Coates in the house. My beautiful hey, brother. Happy Good birthday! Morning. Yeah. He had a birthday. Yes, what was he it did. yesterday or yes, he did. Yeah, happy birthday, yeah, man. Yeah, happy I wished birthday. him a happy natal anniversary. <laughs> did. Natal. Yeah. Did he turn fifty? I think he I saw the post where he's is I he is I he fifty now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um that was his physical birth birthday. I was like, yeah. Oh, Hell 50. He looks so young. I, I've actually reached the point where I look back at 50 and it sounds young to me. It does. And I remember when 50, <laughs> I remember when 50, I said, wow, yeah. and these people are still yeah. walking around. <laughs> uh, hey, Joyce is here. Look at that. Yeah. Hey, hey sister, how yeah. you doing? Dear sweet Joyce. Hope you're doing She's well. She's back. She's, I, she's got to be out of the hospital by yeah, now. But she's uh, happy to be back, and we're happy to have her back. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. amen. Um, she sent me a nice little thing uh, uh, one day. So praise the um, Lord. Thank you. Davey, 34, he says in John 13, 18, I was there Wednesday night, John 13 and 14. So what mm -hmm. question could you have? <laughs> so I probably unless, screwed it up. Unless I he <laughs> listened to the message. And that's He's going to fix something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, he, uh, the Messiah quoted Psalm 41, nine. Yes, he did. Yes. That, yes. Um, uh, the, uh, that's the one about the, I think, uh, that's the one about the heel lifted up his heel against me. Uh, in any event quoted Psalm 41, nine and spoke the Hebrew word lechem, which is leavened bread and not matzah or unleavened bread because he was eating leavened bread when Judas uh, took the sop. Satan entered Judas after this, and he left the supper as day 13. I did not think to 
uh, dive into the the words that he spoke. Uh, that's really interesting. I have always thought he probably had taken that that sop was. Um, Bullinger yeah. said it was a morsel. Um, other dic- I think uh, Webster said it's a morsel that's usually dipped in something, and um, so I always assumed it was bread dipped in olive oil. Yeah, um, I always thought it had to be something soft, not like the yeah hard stuff we yeah. serve. Yeah, I was under the impression that they were not allowed to eat leavened bread yeah. for the Passover. Correct. I don't remember That's what I remember anyway. I don't remember. Um, uh, I wouldn't doubt. In any event, he says uh, this was to fulfill the psalm. That's the reason it had to be done like this. Amazing. Um, Amazing. And John quotes the psalm here. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Yep. 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 Uh, I, you know, when I get to that, that hmm. verse in John 13, my mind does not think very long about the sop, but it thinks about Satan entering him. And, um, I, uh, we, we tried to, um, do a little bit of exegesis on that. I think uh, I suspect hmm. Satan entered him for the sake of logistics. Uh, it's not that his Judas's free will, he would have lost his free will, but he would have come under a strong influence having Satan inside of him. Make, who is which was designed to make sure he doesn't screw this up, <laughs> arresting yeah. Jesus. All right. And I suspect one of the questions I always had was, how did Judas know Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because Satan told him. Yeah. Because Satan's demons kept him well, well, oh, yeah. well aware of everywhere Jesus was and what he was doing. No, so Satan is not um, omniscient. No, he right, but he's got, got he got he, minions. Yeah, he's got he's got uh, demons doing stakeouts. Oh, that was that, that was a better <laughs> word. The dominions, demons, demons. Yeah, yeah. and he uh, doing uh, stakeouts, and uh, so Judas, when he went to go get those men to collect to arrest Jesus, he will always he would have always known where Jesus was. Yeah. at any yeah. moment in time. Yeah, makes sense. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, but I that was always a question I had growing up. Well, I always thought it was interesting when you look at that passage. It, it's obviously a, um, um, a forelook to Judas. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The Lord yeah, Jesus exactly. Christ knew who Judas was. He washed his feet along with the rest of the 12. He had the meal and he called him his, his own very, uh-huh. what, familiar friend it was right like, yeah in psalm familiar yeah. friend right so is it possible to have a close relationship between someone that's regenerate and someone that's not yeah For sure yeah and he he publicly called him friend in the garden yes he yeah. did yeah. and and publicly shared his love with him mm-hmm. uh, today. uh speaking of love for a friend my beautiful brother how you doing? It is so awesome to see you. There he is. There he hey is. Hey guys, how are you guys doing? How you doing, man? Dude. How's the family? Uh, we're doing pretty good. We've got spring break this week. Um, so this is the end of my spring break. I got to go back to work on Monday, but we're oh, doing well. <laughs> uh, I'll bet you did a lot of research. And uh, did you make new videos this week? I mean, what? No. Nope. I actually took a week off. I've basically done nothing except prepare for my sermon for Sunday morning. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Me it's and hard you both. to imagine. That's all we've you been, mean, we've you been mean that he on. prepared for a sermon? No, yeah. that he actually did nothing. Yeah. Yeah. We always yeah. thought you never yeah. didn't have to prepare. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. Yeah. no. Um, uh, so, uh, all right. So Brian, now let me see here. Uh, Brian over the first, the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that on Sunday mornings, main service messages, Brian has been going through the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. And this last Sunday he did faith and here's, here's a clip. Here's a clip of, uh, Brian talking about the fruit of the spirit and faith. So the last fruit of the spirit mentioned Verse 22 is faith. Can you hear that okay? okay. Yeah. Don't forget the beginning of verse 22. But, so, are the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22 and 23 being contrasted with the works of the flesh? Yes. 20 and 21. Okay? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Okay? 
So as a fruit of the Spirit, faith is contrasted with the works of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. Okay? Good point. Someone as such, it. I believe. This is, my, this is what I've come to understand. So if it's wrong, you have no one to blame but me, okay? <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> In short order, maybe we will. Okay, okay. Sorry. As such, I believe faith as a fruit of the Spirit is related to relying and trusting in the sufficiency of Christ and His Word yep. to get your needs met. Not in your own ability, your own strength, or your own power, according to the flesh. Hmm. Again, Say good. it again. Faith, I believe faith is related to relying and trusting in the sufficiency of Christ and His Word to get your needs met, and not your own ability, strength, or power, according to the flesh. Well, so far. That is what I have come to understand and believe faith is as a fruit of the Spirit. And the thing that just fascinates me about all of this is what this means is that we have a 100% total victory plan in Christ. Amen. Okay? And what we need to do is just get out of the Spirit's way. Yep. And every day, every moment, every second, make a choice of faith to not walk in the flesh, but to walk after lust. Amen. Yeah, it's a weird watching myself and having to listen to myself. <laughs> I understand the pain. <laughs> yes, thank you, Joel. Everybody's identified yeah. with you, brother. Well, I like to make my guests feel uncomfortable as quickly as possible. <laughs> Success. Success now, has been achieved. Now, you thought, I love this. I love the topic. You have the you, – nobody – when you think of fruit of the Spirit, you never think faith. You think of all the other good stuff. Faith is the last, yeah. and yet it's the most interesting word on that list, I'd say. How do you explain I, that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. At the beginning of that sermon, I kind of admitted that that's the one that I've struggled with the most. I totally um, understand. As, as far as like, what? how do you explain it and, and what's going on? Exactly. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I, I can relate to that. Uh, you know, because the question is, and, and my question to the panel is, is how wrong was Brian and can we blame him for anything and anything he said there? <laughs> well, and, I, and am I, and, uh, no, what you're going to need to do is go back and do a redo <laughs> and say something that. <laughs> what are the options that are on the table about faith and the fruit of the spirit? Is, is, is this. Is this like when you study the word and you it, it deepens your faith, the spirit is actually imparting some of his faith inside of you? Or is this you mirroring his faith that he already has in the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, Hal can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably yes, all the above, maybe. Right. I, I work from the, from the point that there is an intrinsic link between the spirit, the Holy Spirit, and faith. Uh, when, when I read Galatians, for instance, he says, Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the by hearing, hearing of faith. faith. Uh, uh, he said uh, the same thing in, in chapter 3. Uh, he that ministereth you the Spirit, uh, is it by the hearing of faith? Um, he talks about that ye might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Mm. And uh, that... that promise of the spirit uh, actually i think predates the uh dispensation of the grace of god where did god promise us the spirit you know the promise is is back there but we have the there's this link between faith and the spirit i just always thought it was interesting that faith in the fruit was so far down the list right but then again, I think of a passage like 1 Corinthians 13. Now abideth faith, faith. Hope, hope, charity. Yes. The greatest is charity. And right. you go to the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, love joy, joy, peace, peace. long-suffering, so forth. It's amazing faith isn't first on that list. Well, that's you would in our logical mind, that's what we would 
Right. Think. Right. You would think so. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not going to question God. <laughs> uh, it, it, now, the, it, the other the other option is that it could be a reference to the faith of the Holy Spirit too, mm-hmm. in that mm-hmm. in which uh, it seems like Brian had alluded to in in the uh, in his uh, message, yeah. and you have evidence of the faithfulness of the entire Godhead in Paul's epistles, mm-hmm. uh, yes. faith of the f- faithfulness of God. Uh, the faith of the operation of God. You have, of course, the faith of Christ. And then, mm. you know, here, maybe mm. you could allu- mm. use that as yeah. the faith of the Holy Spirit. Well, again, you, you look at, go, go back to the question, is, is faith the product of the Spirit, or do we access the Spirit through faith? Yeah. And, and Right. You know, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. another yes question. But, I mean, uh, the separate components are interesting. Uh, if we are talking about the faith of the Spirit, well, that, that makes sense because our faith is in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, to right. be who he says he is, right. and, and we could go, we could make the same link to the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit would have the faith in the faith of <laughs> yeah. both Christ and the Father. I, you know, Brian, I, 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 I'm trying to loop Brian in here. I can't think of it. What do you think, Brian? Um, well, I think it. The, I think I would say yes to what Hal said. I think both are like different sides of the same coin. The thing that the thing that has struck me as I've gone through all the fruit of the spirit there, which I'm not done with yet. I still have to finish um, meekness. Uh, verse, verse 20, yeah, yeah. Um, they are all attributes of God Almighty. Yeah, um, yeah. and when you right. when you study them out, and it makes sense that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all involved in in all of that and Mm. to me it's an issue of you know when we walk in the spirit we manifest the fruit of the spirit we reflect the new life of christ that's been in us um through the power of the holy spirit so the indwelling holy spirit and the word of god you know the spirit working conjunction with the word working effectually in you so i i i've just been struck by how related all the fruit of the spirit are to the attributes of God himself. Mm-hmm. Amen. I thought it was interesting that contrast you were making. I mean, it, it, uh, and yes, the fruit of the spirit was meant to contrast the works of the flesh. And yet it would seem like the reference to faith uh, is being a kind of, um, you know, the works of, is the, the life of the believer uh, operating in stark contrast to the work of the, of the, of the, of the flesh, which requires the faith and the spirit in order to, to, Mm-hmm. have that righteous walk that God's right. looking for. Right. Um, yep. yep. The uh, other thing I, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. We've got Hal for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing I, I I've sort of really been kicking the tires on is it seems to me. And I've right now, this is sort of just at the level of observation. I'm, I'm trying to work it through, but it seems to me that all of the rest of the fruit there in Galatians five are enveloped in the first one of love. Mm -hmm. Um, And it kind of seems to follow when you take like first Corinthians 13 and you follow the statements that Paul makes about, you know, what charity is um, that seems like a lot of them sort of flow out of or result from uh, love and charity sort of being the, the main one, right? The, 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 so. When Paul does list that is common, where the first one would be the big heading, and then the others seem to follow, like the uh, uh, the uh, end times, First uh, Timothy four, the the or Second Timothy three, where he's talking about the characteristics of times, and men shall be lovers of themselves, and everything else is the inevitable result of an excessive self love in that list. So it is kind of a common uh, uh, method of Paul to uh, have that big heading like that. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, I also have some dirt on Brian. Good. I'm very oh. excited about this. Oh, the, uh, <laughs> I have some stories about Brian when he was a kid. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Your daddy's been talking. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I had heard that when Brian was a kid, things went bad. He would he would he would ask if he could pray for the rapture to come. <laughs> he says we got stuck in the mud out in the middle of nowhere. He said, I can pray for the rapture. 
at home when he would go to bed, he would ask if the rapture happens tonight, will I hit my head on the ceiling? <laughs> so I guess he was kind of fascinated by the rapture. Yeah. <laughs> Are you yeah, talking boy. to my mom or my dad? Which one is the Yes, uh... yes, yep. <laughs> yeah. They had they had a they had a conversation before they gave me that answer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gwen and I were talking about the rapture this morning and you know, our question was we needed to identify an unbeliever that we knew that when the rapture took place, we could make an agreement that they'd come over and take care of our dogs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're not believers. Will you take care of the dogs after we disappear? That'd be kind of nice. Um, yeah, that's awesome. The uh, Here's another question I have for you. Um, from this Generation Forever series, yes. you've been doing this, I don't know how long. It's going back to what, 2018? Ancient history. Ancient 2000. History. Like yeah, 2015. Yeah. It's 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 the series that's about to last a whole generation, and uh, <laughs> labor of love. <laughs> Have you given any thought to how you're going to end the series? Yeah, I mean, I have, and I'm I'm starting to do that uh, a lot more because I'm I'm kind of getting to the end of what I think needs to be talked about, um, but. Um, but then I, I wonder, okay, well, do I need to spend time talking about how the Bible was undone, if you will, by, you know, um, uh, critical methodology? You know, do I stop when I'm finished talking about the King James Bible or do I also include like you know, how, how the, the text of the Reformation, the, the Textus Receptus in Greek, the King James Bible in English were undone in this 19th century by, you know, text criticism and higher criticism and how all that happened. I, I, I'd be curious to know actually what you guys think, if you think that kind of stuff should be included, uh, or is that, going too far i i don't know i that's why I, I struggle with those things that well, sounds fine with me i wouldn't have a problem with it well it seems I relevant i think it would be uh interesting to uh you know to be able to hear that viewpoint mm. okay. i always think it's interesting to hear the viewpoint of the people contemporary to the time that it was translated yeah and and the thoughts of the translators and right. and yeah. and the the thoughts of those um uh, beforehand uh Tyndall and, and Wycliffe and, and, and so forth, because, again, we realize that the translation is not an issue of inspiration. It is an issue of preservation. Amen. That, of course, that which is preserved is that which is, is inspired. But I, I think there's value in understanding the, <laughs> the thinking of the men involved in the work toward what they were doing. Mm. So to that point, Hal, I would say that um, I've included, I went all the way back. There's a ton of information in the class about Tyndall. We've gone, I've, I've dissected in detail the preface to the 1611, uh, looking at what um, the thoughts of the translators actually were as represented by Miles Smith when he wrote that. And then also on the issue of the marginal notes and I've, I've tried to really cover in detail aspects of this that haven't gotten a lot of attention, which is one reason why it's taken so long. Um, I'm trying to find the John Snodgrass has this hilarious comment about Brian. Uh, he, uh, he says he's trying to, Oh, it's, it's a lot longer on a list here. He says, I'm, um, I'll just read it here. I was closing some things, way too many tabs open and behind the scenes stuff, bogging me down. Brian is a bad influence on me in that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a question here from Alex, our brother, Alex. Hey. Uh, Alex was, uh, at the, he's a, a kid at the Florida regional grace conference who, uh, uh, loves him some Brian Ross. Mm. And um, he says, I really enjoy your From This Generation Forever series. Last month, I had the opportunity to do a short presentation on the King James Bible in an honors college class on Shakespeare. Uh, the references at the end of your notes were incredibly helpful. When preparing the presentation, I study history at the University of South Florida and want to be a history teacher like you. Ooh. Oh, 
Um, oh, that sounds like a very smart man right there. <laughs> <laughs> he is a really smart kid. He yeah. talks a lot too. I love. Uh, yeah. I loved every yeah. moment I spent with yeah. him. And uh, he's like, I think I might be the next Brian Ross. I said, Do you realize how early Brian gets up in the morning? Uh, like I, <laughs> that's a long uh, day. Do you good. realize? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the con, it's cool that he was able to do that in a Shakespeare class. Yes, right. uh, that's yes. what I was thinking. Because <laughs> get kicked out, right? I've I've made the argument in um in the from this generation forever class, and I'm sure Alex, that was his name, right? Um, he he might be referring to. It is my opinion that when the English church left Catholicism and laid aside the mass. In other words, they were no longer practicing the Roman Catholic mass that it left a hole in the culture. And what filled the hole in the culture was the theater, which would have been Shakespeare and the other playwrights of that era. And then yep. what happens is the King James translators are reared and steeped in this audible auditory culture of the, of the play and when they then go to translate, they are in many cases translating with an ear tuned to how the text is going to sound when it's read out loud. And I think there's some real fascinating history there that, that really speaks to what they were doing and how they did it. And one of the, the surviving sources says that one of the things they did at the last meeting is somebody stood at a lectern and they read the proposed translation out loud and guys would just sit there and listen to it. And then if somebody had an objection, they would raise their hand and then they would discuss what, uh, you know, what the objection might be. It could have been auditory objection. It could have been a more technical translation question. But I, I think that that's a whole part of what they were doing and why they did what they did that is often overlooked. Yes. Mm. You know, I agree. Uh, one of the things is it's just the, the King James is easy to read. Mm. And, uh, you know, when they you talk to people about the modern translations and they think, well, it's easier to read. It's uh, and you go back and you study and, you know, it was written on an eighth King James on an eighth grade level and the, the newer translations are 12th grade level. So, but it's not just the e that part. It it is w the way it sounds and the way it's projected. One of the reasons why I love the King James. Uh, I had uh, I have an idea about how you could end the from this generation forever series, but you're welcome to reject oh, it. Let me just say, <laughs> you can, you can. oh, we are all ears, brother. <laughs> Tell them the uh, man. I read a book called John Dyer's uh, People of the Screen, which compared. Uh, the the effect of studying print versus digital and uh the uh this book um uh, i uh when i couldn't sleep at night i would go into the other room and read this book because he just knocks me right out yeah um digital. it's just phenomenally boring you'll love it i think you would love it like crazy uh he tries to be intellectual but he's not mm -hmm. you know but it was pretty interesting the comparison between physical versus digital with digital you have a lot of interruptions and notifications and uh, commercials and things that happen with print, you actually have a different emotional experience with print. Print is, I believe it that. is, it yeah. is, you know, oftentimes like a Bible is a gift. It's your dad's Bible or something. It has that sense of permanence. Whereas in digital, you get that yeah. sense of uh, transitory, not permanent, you know, not valuable. Which, which you'll discover when the battery goes dead. <laughs> <laughs> or your screen uh, 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 freezes up while you're preaching. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that might interest you. Well, uh, it is interesting, and you all all know of this. You've been digital almost all your life. Yeah, I, well, ever since digital came out, know, I've been digital. And, yeah, and I'm only digital because I have to be. But I the digital – Bible. The majority of people, when they just want to read their Bible, they read the print. But when it comes to study, they always go digital mm -hmm. uh, nowadays. And um, uh, and digital, I love because it makes it rewires the way you think about how you remember Scripture. I have to remember it now in mm -hmm. terms of theme and you know subject of mm -hmm. chapters rather than yeah, it where it's located on my page. page. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I still get um, my Bible and, out every once in a while and hold yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
the uh, okay. The other thing I want to I want to mention here. Uh, you have a new book coming out. Oh, great! Uh, let me see here. I've got a pretty picture of this uh, awesome cover, which is just my favorite here. Uh, I have. Well, where's it at? Um, is that the one you showed us? Or? <laughs> I don't know where it went. Is this it? I don't know where. Uh, where's my. Uh, I, losing your mind this morning. I'm, 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 oh man, I'm having some technical issues. All right, you want here, me to send it to you? <laughs> no, no. Oh, here we go. It just now it decided to work. Uh, the myth of verbatim identicality: How God actually preserved His word by you and some guy I've never heard of him, David W. Reed. Oh um, yeah. Now sure. let me ask you: What was the uh, and I love this cover. Uh, that's just amazing. You must have had some somebody must have been a great, hey, wonderful uh, influence on you to have a cover so beautiful with a scribe <laughs> and a copy machine. That's hilarious. Well, Joel, since you're fi since you're fishing for a compliment, uh, <laughs> I I did I did send the concept. So Dave and I we were struggling with what what should the cover be, and. I had this idea uh, one morning and I said, Hey, I said, Hey, Joel, can you run through AI the idea of a scribe at a photocopy machine making identical copies of a text? And then he, he sent me, Joel sent me a couple mock ups. Oh, yeah. um, I still have like, them. I love these. Yeah. I love these paintings. I love them too much. Look at this he guy. This is yeah. hilarious. Um, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those those so, uh, pictures make yeah. me happy. So from yeah. there, we uh, kind of shared with Randy, the publisher, uh, those images that Joel provided. And then <laughs> he, he kind of went to work on it and came up with that last... Yeah that last one that he showed that showed there. Uh, now, what was the, uh, no. Okay. So the, you've been, you guys have been working on this book a long time. What yeah. was the motivation? What was the reason that you decided to do this book together? Well, I, I I'd be curious what Dave would say to this, but I, it really goes back to, <laughs> to, it really goes back to 2011. Um, in 2011, there was the year that, across the country uh, a lot of the bible conferences that are associated with pastor jordan were mm. doing the 400th anniversary of the king james bible in you know 2011 yeah well that year um a guy who go who went to my church put into my hands david norton's book a textual history of the king james bible and i started mm. reading it and i realized that there were some things about the printed history of the King James text that did not were not jiving with things that people had always said about it. And Dave and I started having a conversation in that year about what what to make of this and how to think about it. And then from there over the last you know what 12, 13 years, um I've been working on that. He's been helping me with that. And, you know, what we sort of decided to do is, you know, I have, I have massive pages and pages and pages of research, uh, you know, in the, in the, from this generation forever class about the topic of preservation. And what, what, what we essentially did is synthesized all that down to like a primer to just like a, almost like a legal brief, you know, um, of the information. Um, and so it's been revised and rehashed and we've sent it to different people asking for feedback um, over the last five years. I was one of them. Do you still have two spaces after every period? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know. All right. How would you, uh, how would you define, uh, um, uh, verbatim identicality and what was what would be you know the reason why you guys had uh, put this uh, term together so there's it, it stems from the realization that there's an assumption that preservation required verbatim identicality or xeroxed identicality right 
So I could take a piece of paper to a copy machine, run it through and get exactly verbatim copies of whatever it was that I ran through the machine, right? That's the irony of the cover art of the book, right? But the problem is, you know, for most of world history, copy machines didn't exist. So manuscripts were copied by hand and inevitably, you know, inadvertent copying mistakes were made as well as intentional malicious mistakes or changes, right? Both are happening at the same time as you study the history of the text. Um, and the assumption that, that preservation, so if you think about modern evangelicalism right. and you read, and you read their doctrinal statements, they say that inspiration and infallibility are in the original autographs only. And the reason they say that is because that the originals are identical to themselves. And it's really an assumption that you have to have verbatim identicality of wording in order to have, you know, the per quote, perfect word of God. Well, on the other side of that spectrum, you have uh, well-intended King James defenders and King James advocates that are willing to say, well, if you don't have the pure Cambridge edition, a circa 1900 Cambridge Bible from the Cambridge University Press, then you don't really have the pure word of God either. And on both of those sides of that spectrum, the assumption is that you have to have verbatim identicality of wording. Right. What, what I realized is that that doesn't exist. So my thought process was, well, how do you deal with it? And so then I said, well, the reason I believe in inspiration and preservation is because that's what the scriptures teach. teach. So I, so I said, let's go back to the scriptures to see if they'll instruct us about how to think now about the secondary issue of how the preservation occurred mm -hmm. and that whole process working itself out in real time in the week by week teaching of my class is, you know, now synthesized in the book. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question to Brian on, on that subject, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. This battle, so to speak, between proponents and opponents, if you will, uh, on the KJV goes back with me over 40 years. <coughs> and I've often wondered where the the idea, the premise of verbatim identicality came from. <laughs> I, I do remember uh, in, in a Bible conference that, that uh, someone took the statement of faith that I had written for our particular church and and got up and read it and intentionally misread it saying word for word. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> not being bashful, I stood up and I said, it doesn't say that. And I said, I know it doesn't say that. I wrote that, I know what it says. And they said, well, that's what it means. And so I, I've often wondered is if this, this is it so much that, a majority of King James Bible believers at some point in time actually taught verbatim identicality, or is it more uh, a response is that is the accusation that comes from those that, uh, that don't believe that it's the preserved word of God. So, you know, wh <laughs> where does this come from? I mean, is it, is it a reaction from the opponents or is, you know, I, I don't fully understand the, the, the origin between uh, those two positions in that Yeah, sense. so uh, let me do my best to try to it's explain my understanding of it from sort of a 10,000-foot level. So it really starts in my mind in the late 1600s when Catholic clerics start to attack Protestantism. And there's a guy named Richard Simon in the 1680s who writes a book where he attacks the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura. And he says, well, you guys have variants in these manuscripts and in, in your printed editions of the Texas Receptus. Therefore you need us, the magisterium of the Catholic church to be able to tell you what the scriptures are. And so there's this idea deposited into the thought stream that works its way through. And it really comes to fruition in the late latter half of the 19th century when German higher critics and textual critics start to really bang the drums on you guys have textual variants. And 
So what ends up happening, and you, you can look this up, and I think you'll find how this is accurate. Benjamin Breck, Benjamin Breckage, what Breckenridge Warfield goes to Germany. He's a Princetonian theologian. He's supposed to be defending the Westminster Confession of Faith at Princeton Theological Seminary. He goes to Germany and he studies, and he comes back, and he rewrites the Protestant understanding of inspiration by confining inspiration and infallibility to the originals only. That is not a theological position that existed within Protestantism until Warfield enunciates that view, and he's doing it as a response to higher criticism, taking them up on their own premise instead of retreating back to the doctrine as it was outlined in the um, you know Westminster Confession mm -hmm. of Faith on right. Bibliology. And then what I think happens is slowly over mm -hmm. when the when the revised version first came out in 1881 and then the American mm -hmm. uh, standard in 1901, these did not immediately replace the King James Bible in terms of uh, usage, et cetera, in the English speaking church until after world war two. And then the modern King James only movement, as I've thought about this and studied it is really a reactionary view against the originals only view that first began to be articulated by Warfield and Hodge. And what both are fundamentally trying to deal with is the issue of verbatim identicality. Right. And so then that just sort of sweeps away now into the argumentation of what becomes pro King James position. Hmm. Um, hmm. When's the book coming out? Uh, the exact release date is still undetermined. <laughs> the goal, the goal is to have it available. Hopefully, when we go to the April meeting in Chicago at the end of April. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I and I, I have a million things I could ask about that, but I know there's some saints uh, have some questions in the live chat. I'm seeing the time. We got ten minutes, so I'm going to dive into a couple of these questions here. <laughs> One of which is going to make me smile. Uh, real quick, Robert Craig, uh, Luke twenty three forty six, John nineteen thirty. Can you speak to the difference between spirit and ghost and spirit? Um, I am not. I do not see a difference between either of those yeah. expressions. Yeah. Do you? Does no, anybody? I, I usually just think they're the same thing. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, different way of saying the same thing. Um. There was uh, uh, a chapter, Joel, there's a chapter yeah. in the book about that, by the way, about oh, spirit, but, Holy Spirit, go Holy Ghost. Is that in the King James book or which book it's are we talking the book, about? Yeah, no, it's in the book coming out next month. Oh, is there? I, I forgot about that. Hmm. Um, there is. Uh, and um, OK, so I'll just I'll just move on to the next comment here. There was one in here about. If Brian had heard about <laughs> the King James Museum. <laughs> oh, man. JP, okay, Jay Peeler says, thank you for your understanding. Outstanding research and preparation you put into each one of your sermons and YouTube videos. That man works on his messages all week long. Am, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Uh, do you work on them in between classes at school? No comment. The, uh, <laughs> uh, at least, uh, for sure up here yes up here, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh um uh hilarious how are you going to do uh, resurrection sunday differently after you've done resurrection sunday the same for you know decades yeah i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna focus on the story of uh abraham and isaac and mm. Abraham offering Isaac and what it says in Hebrews about that he knew assuredly God would raise him from the dead. So I'm going to kind of play with that a little bit. Well, that's pretty powerful. Oh, uh, this, this I love Genesis 22. Yeah, I couldn't wait. I can't wait to ask Brian this question. This yeah. is James Watkins, our dear brother. He says, Brian Ross, have you ever heard of the 1611 King James Bible Museum and author G. John Rove, Rova, or whatever. And then John Snodgrass says, did, James, did you see Lucas preaching in there in that museum? <laughs> Do you have any comments about that, brother? <laughs> oh, I have lots of comments. <laughs> Should I play the Scrabble video? <laughs> we don't have time for the Scrabble video. The I, Scrabble video I, makes me laugh. Um, 
I bought I got I I've got a, I bought his book right here. It came two days ago. So I'm actually, you know, reading what the guy has to say, but I am not impressed. I think there was a lot of stuff said that was private interpretation that is claiming to have advanced revelation found within the King James Bible. Uh, I mean, in one video, he literally goes through and finds his initials in uh, on a page in the 1611 and says, see, this is God's this is proof of some sort of, you know, prophetic unction that I have to talk about these advanced revelations in the 1611. Um, right. I'm, I'm, the museum is cool. He's got a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, like hands down, there's a lot of stuff that I would like to go see. The problem is the, uh, the explanation of what all this means, I think is, is, um, I have some issues with it. Yeah, the Scrabble video was said it all to me, all for me. Uh, but King James Museum would be cool. Larry Gabbard is actually there today. He, uh, he, otherwise he was going to jump in and and hang with us. Um, uh, that's pretty funny. Uh, John Snodgrass says Brian sent me the PDF. I'll still buy the book. <laughs> um, Have you guys uh, been getting a lot of comments all week about that museum? No. No, I, I had not brought it up, uh, except in private with, with uh, Fred and, and Hal and Lori and I looked yeah, at it. Yeah, I even Lori I'm, con like I'm concerned about it. You know, I, I I just hope people have enough discernment to realize that some of the stuff being claimed there is is um pretty potentially dangerous. Ludicrous is what comes to mind. <laughs> Um, I'm sure he would find a way to make Ludacris uh, uh, come to 1611 <laughs> and points on Scrabble. <laughs> hey, and, and he's a and he's a rapper, so you know, yeah, Ludacris. Yeah, there was that one video where he's like, "Well, if you open the King in the introduction, I can see my initials in the King James," and I'm yeah. just like, Brian's like, do, "Do you see your initials in the in the King James?" I said, "I got a whole book named after me, brother. I don't know about you." <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Charlie Charlie McQuellen sent me a message and he says, "Well, Brian, your first name starts with a B, and your last name ends with an S. So, what does that tell us about you?" <laughs> come, to your, come to your own conclusions about that. <laughs> Charlie stole the show. Yep. He did best yep. joke of that the day. Is, I love is, that. Is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I do want to say to Brian how much I appreciate this particular work early on in my in my uh, walk as I began to journey down that path of understanding what I actually hold in my hands when I hold the Word of God. Right. Amen. Yeah. Was a, a great deal of confusion on my part. Um, you know, for instance, if I would ask the question, well, where do you find inspiration in the original autographs? And you ask most people and they, of course, they turn to second Timothy and where that, where that leads you is to an idea that, that, that which we <laughs> hold is the process of inspired translators and it was a revelation to me to understand that the reference in, in Second Timothy was was not to the original autographs. He was talking about the copies that Timothy had possessed, the Holy Scriptures, which were child. probably a translation, it had to be e even into Greek, and they were the Holy Scriptures. They were still perfect. They were still authentic, uh, authentic. And so I had to arrive at a point where I understood that verbatim identicality was an impossibility. That's an impossibility between two languages. It's, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. You, you can't go from one language to another. Right. But you can translate it accurately Amen. and so that it's without mistakes. Right. And, and that understanding kept me from chucking my Bible into the, into the right. burn can. Right. There was, uh, in Brian's book, real quick, he had some fast facts about uh, verbatim identicality that was that has stuck with me even after having read this early version. 
Uh, one of the fast facts was that none of the 5200 extant Greek manuscripts have verbatim identicality with one another, which the implication being that 99.9% of those manuscripts don't represent the preserved word of God if there's no verbatim identicality. That's right. You, wow. have, the, you have the same, there's no extant Greek manuscript that matches any edition of the Textus Receptus published by Erasmus, Stephanus, Beza, or the uh, this other guy I can't pronounce with verbatim identicality. And the, and the implication being either no extent Greek manuscript represents the preserved word of God or no edition of the Texas Receptus represents the preserved word of God. Wow. And if it wasn't, and Brian's work helped me to appreciate verbatim identicality is not required. Right. You can still say the same thing differently and still be accurate. Be accurate. Right. Well, that's yeah, what so I always, of evidence. Right. Just, Right. That's right. why I loved. Uh, that's what I got out of Grace School of the Bible and manuscript evidence. Right. You know, it was that was a fantastic class. It right. Really, I didn't even know I had a question about the the Word of God. I always believed it was there. Right. But when I got here and and, and the school understood there was a lot of conflict, a lot of stuff going on. Right. Manuscript right. evidence was fantastic. Brian's chomping at the bit here. What's your reaction to well, all of that, brother? So I, I would just say, you know, first of all, Hal, I appreciate you saying that. Um, and, and to me, there's like, there's two, there's two principles that I explain in, in different ways, right? So preservation. So first of all, there's a difference between a different way of saying the same thing and a substantive difference in meaning. Right. The reason I object to modern versions of the critical text is because they substantively alter the doctrinal content of the Bible right. because they change. They're not just simply different ways of saying the same thing. They are substantively different from each other in what right. they right. say. Right. So that's and then then. So there's not verbatim identicality, but what there has to be. And we argue this in the book is there has to be verbal equivalence. Right. Right. You could right. say, you could say, I went to the store at six thirty, or you could say, I went to the store at half past six. You don't have verbatim identicality, but you still have verbal equivalence, even though you're not using the exact same words. That's the still, point. Do you still call it content equivalence, or is it verbal equivalent? We changed it. We changed it to verbal equivalence because we felt like we were getting too much. People were reading the book as we put it out for feedback. And it seemed to us that people were understanding us to be saying we're okay with dynamic equivalence, which we are not okay. Right, right. Like, no, and, no. And That's so, what I was just about to ask you. Right, <laughs> right. And so we say verbal equivalence because we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, verbal preservation, but the preservation has to occur. It does not have to have verbatim identicality. It has to have verbal equivalence. Um. Uh, do you still have the purer than fungus example in the in the book? <laughs> you remember white as uh, snow, and then you replace snow with fungus. You know, uh, and that being a, an example of dynamic equivalence suggests that you know when does purer than snow? You, you remember that one? Yeah, that, I, I honestly I'd have to look back at the manuscript. <laughs> I I think it's still there, but I don't it's remember. It's not in there. You need to put it back in there. I love purer than fungus. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, okay, I got to dive into the questions real quick. Vincini, uh, people are saying that the unexplainable growing hematite on the moon is from Revelation. The moon will turn to blood because the original name for blood is used as hema. Is that true? And it seems like the red cows are here and maybe the temple is on the way. That's a, Those are phenomenal questions, brother. Now, we talked about the red cows. Uh, what was it, Monday? I, I can't remember. I have, I'm a big red cow. She, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the biggest red cow expert <laughs> in the grace movement on the red heifers. I very, love the red cows. Very humbly and, said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, look, if you want a deep dive on that, check that, check that, check that video out. And we, we talk about in the first half hour of, I think, Monday's podcast. Uh, the red heifers is fascinating endlessly. The moon turning to blood, I think, correlates with it's. It has nothing to do with anything on the moon. It has to do with it. Co it correlates with the sun diminishing, I think. Uh, either that, or it's just a miraculous thing that happens after uh, after the judgments begin in the first half of the tribulation. You okay with that, Brian? Uh, yeah, sure. For now, 
<laughs> he, he can correct uh, me I mean, later. He, yeah. he was very wordy. I couldn't remember what his point was going to be while he's speaking. <laughs> let me think. You uh, let me think of uh, see if I can find any other comments for Brian here. Joyce, our sweet sister, sweet who uh, came out of the hospital. I know she was studying her Bible in the hospital. The maintenance crew, the cleaning crew, the <laughs> the, the the nurses and the doctors. They all got the gospel. It's awesome to have you here. And she says thank you, Brian, for all of your hard work and ministry. Um, Thanks for listening. Uh, perhaps a more fitting name for that museum would be the Ripplinger Museum. <laughs> uh, it's two after 11. I would totally get Brian to talk about uh, Gail Ripplinger, but uh, we, we, he will be talking about her soon enough in uh, in some new uh, videos that he'll be posting soon. Are we going to get those videos on the built-in dictionary this the next week, or are we still working on that? So... Um... I'm still working on it. I've got two more that I, I'm working on one on parallelism and Hebraisms. Um, and then I want, I need to do one last one. So, and I, I don't want to release any of them until I have them all finished. Um, but I will be having quite a bit to say about uh, some of the stuff rippling your head to say about the built-in dictionary. Yes, it's totally epic. All right, anything else we want to we want to say to Brian before we let him go? It's three after eleven. Love you. I got to get him on 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 uh, on time. Uh, love you, brother. Yes, Brian yes. is so yes. uncool. He's cool, and we yeah. are <laughs> proud to have him here with us. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate seeing Hal and Fred and Joel, and um, <laughs> you know, I unfortunately I. I can't come on as often as I might like because of my schedule, but maybe I'll see you guys again this summer if I have opportunity. Uh, that's great. Give, give Becky a great big hug and a kiss. That's uh, what we missed about the whole thing today was Becky. Yep. Yeah. We love yep. Becky. Yeah. Take okay. care. Thanks guys. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, All man. right, brother. <laughs> Fantastic <sighs> guest. <laughs> we we could have we i could have talked to brian uh for 10 hours straight yeah. i think we could have easily gone on all day yeah but here's the question could he how listen much, to you, you for 10 hours <laughs> well my question was how much time you talked to him for 10 hours i mean two <laughs> two hours is enough for me <laughs> <laughs> one hour is enough for everybody on on wednesday night yeah, yeah. come on let's just that uh, we're done joel yeah, yeah. quit talking now <laughs> paul could preach hours and hours and hours yeah. and in fact yeah. You preached all night when that guy fell out the I window. Didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you call me wordy. Paul preaches all night long. Yeah, but he has something Re to say. <laughs> uh, Robert Craig says, I wish I had as much hair on top as how. If I got mine done, people would say you shaved your head. All right. <laughs> And John Songress had said, I got my grandmother's hair. I hope she don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to reach over and just touch Al's hair. I mean, it looks like fine, fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going back through the live chat. I know I missed quite a few. Uh, John Snodgrass says, I remember uh, 30 years ago reading uh, that report with the neurologist and other doctors report on what the crucifixion was like. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And I, I pull no punches and I hold nothing back explaining in detail what he was going through. The thing that creeps me out the most that really gets on, gets to me is, is his back rubbing up against the, the, the wood. You remember mm -hmm. how he was whipped, his back was whipped. It was, I mean, it yeah. was, there was no skin anymore back there and he's having to push himself up in order to breathe and rub it up and against that. Then the look back down. Oh, just off, yeah. oh that well, really gets it reminds to me. me, you know what? And I can't remember how many, what are the, RC say about the is it twelve stations of the cross or mm. or what? And it from their understanding, it's that it was during that time he was paying for sin, the suffering, the the beatings, the whipping, and we know that none of that paid for one sin. Christ had to die. So now Norma quotes uh, uh, Romans. She had quoted earlier Romans five five. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love, love of, of God, God is shed abroad Lord, in our hearts by, by the Holy Ghost, Amen. which is given unto us. Amen. The Holy Numa, uh, which I think is uh, uh, translated both ghost and spirit at times, and I have, and uh, I think the uh, translators had probably uh, just chosen those two words for the sake of variance, as they had talked about in their preface. Um, uh, and, uh, love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Amen. Um, thank you. 
normal. I suspect that love is in two forms. You have you have ex- embraced that love because you've accepted that gospel by grace. So you have that love now because of the knowledge of what his son had done for you and the acceptance of all of that. And then you also have the Holy Spirit that's taken up residence inside of you. Um, Amen. One thing I love about Sunday is getting a hug from Norma. <laughs> Demons doing stakeouts remind me of the screw tape letters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. I, I did not say hello to everybody. It's awesome to see you guys. It Eli is. Stewart's in the house. Hey, we got uh, Rick and Debs in the house. Hey, man. Um, uh, Bob says, "Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Anita says, uh, uh, "Hello." Uh, she Anita's in the house. I mean, it's great to see you. Yes, Jay Peeler's is. here. Uh, James that. Watkins, awesome to see you. Uh, Rick and Deb says, my flesh and the spirit are in constant battle like John. Why is right. it I do the things I shouldn't and not the things I should? Right. Uh, Anita the flesh, says, flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Preach it, brother. <laughs> you <laughs> they're contrary to one to the other. Yeah. You know, that's where a lot of people stop yeah. because say, I just can't win this. But it's the flesh and the spirit. Your spirit, your new man is mm-hmm. fighting against oh. the the flesh, but then you get into the next verse. It says, but ye are not under that law. Amen. Yeah. Well, the other thing I was always taught and I had bought into the idea when it says for the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, these are contrary the one to the other so So that ye cannot do the things things that you would. Mm -hmm. And I always looked at that and it was presented to me as a statement of defeat. Right. Yeah. That's that no matter how well the spirit was was working in my life, the flesh was going to win. When in in, in truth, it's the opposite. It's when the, when we're filled with the spirit, when we yield to the spirit, then we don't do the things that we would do. Right. That's right. right. Amen. We do the things that God would have us do. That's right. Boy. So, <laughs> so, you know, so that you would not do the things that you would is a statement of victory, not a statement of defeat. Especially when you see the period then right after that, but you're not under that law that says you can't do the things that you would. Yeah. Because this, if you let the spirit do your work for you, you know, the flesh is going to be right. defeated every single time. Uh, Anita, uh, how are you doing, Anita? Great Amen. to see you. She says, Romans chapter 8. There and the go. understanding of the faith of the Spirit and trusting it helped me monumentally in solidifying my identity and what it was. Yep. That's a phenomenal statement yep. there. I really love yeah. that uh, mm-hmm. that comment. Thank you. Thank you very mm-hmm. much for that. Um uh, the faith in and faith of is certainly doctrine to understand. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, you know, um, I, 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 I knew that the faith of was kind of a thing with a lot of the the uh, guys who graduated from grade school of the Bible, and it, but in, and when I was young, it never. I was like, well, I don't, whatever. I don't. I never understood it until later in life. Now right. I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, and uh, not just the faith of Christ, but the faith of the entire Godhead. Um, I have this old outline I've been tinkering with for ages about the faith of the entire Godhead. Mm. Uh, uh, and it's got to be as epic as the title, and it's just not there yet. Mm. But, uh, Davey cites Galatians 2.16. All right. I am in love with Galatians 2 all over again because mm. of Pastor Hal and what he has pointed out to me. <laughs> uh, about Galatians 2, and I have not been able to think about it ever since Hal mentioned it. <laughs> I say let's go back up to verse 11. Um, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Yes. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation, their hypocrisy. Yeah. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel— 
I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews, who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Ooh. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be, be justified. justified in his. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid! For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For though, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God, I am Man. crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Amen. Wow. There's nothing to really say about any of that. Um, <laughs> I have to, and the, before we even get into verse 16, I, I'm fascinated by verse 14 and how pointed out a couple weeks ago, what, you know, it never occurred to me what Paul says to Peter here. Yeah. He says, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles yeah. and not as do the Jews. Yeah. In other words, Peter abandoned the law. Yeah, he sure did. He walked away from the law yeah. and the Jews' religion and all tradition. that stuff. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting to watch and to read the, the commentators because they all go nuts. They really do. They go nuts over that passage of Scripture and they try and turn it around and say, well, he's talking about dietary law. The fact that he oh, was oh, uh, you're killing oh, me! Uh, yeah, that's oh, what they want. They they want to take and dil and right. dil and dilute that. So, but if you reverse that, then he said, "Well, why are you requiring then the Gentiles, you know, to live as do the Jews?" So, are you? Uh, is the flip side is? Oh, so you make you're making them eat like Jews do? Yeah. No, <laughs> it, yeah. there's a reason it says exactly. livest right. after the manner. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Good yeah. point. And I love, and that just reinforces uh, my theory that, or our theory, I should say, that uh, Hebrews is about walking away from the Jews' religion, just as Peter had already done. Yeah, already done. Yeah. You, you walk away from that. You, all, they have mm -hmm. already. Christ has already ab mm -hmm. uh, fulfilled the law. He's abolished the law. Mm -hmm. They already have the should have that boldness to enter the holiest mm -hmm. of holies by mm -hmm. the blood of Jesus, mm -hmm. and not just that. They already have a high priest in yeah. heaven. Right. There's no, there's no reason to be following the law anymore. Right. And it, it's not just the fact that the age of grace had begun that they should abandon the law. It's because the law was fulfilled. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, boy, I just really, it just riles me when you think about <laughs> the, the dynamic equivalent that, that the, the modern translators or the translators of the modern text put in there they say they take the faith of christ out and have it insert that it's through faith in christ yeah. oh uh, you know, i could get fighting mad today <laughs> <laughs> um uh yep yeah, uh, brian had mentioned that too uh all, lots of the changes of from faith of christ to faith in christ and mm -hmm. uh and this is, I'm sure, the reason why Davey mentioned yeah. Galatians 2.16. Yeah. We might be justified by the faith of Christ. Yeah. His faithfulness is part of yeah. our own justification. Yeah. And the distinction is made right in the verse. Right. Absolutely. But even we have believed in, in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith, faith of, of Christ. Christ. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> Faithful is things he that different. calleth you who also yeah. will do it. Yet things different are not the same. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. You should Brilliant. be saying words mean things. Yeah, well, they do. <laughs> they do. Yeah. I hate to have to quote him so many times. <laughs> words mean I'm things. Mad, though. Mm. Yeah, you're mad? I, well, I'm well we're all mad. Well, because uh, in the mid acts dispensational sense, I've got blood work at 140 and I haven't been able to eat today. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Man. Good. Yeah. Um, 
I'm fast. Are you still you still fasting? Uh, we broke our fast yesterday. We went from Sunday <laughs> through Thursday. Yeah. And we finally ate Thursday noon. Uh, I used to love to fast. <laughs> I hate it. Well, I, I loved it. Yeah. I, after the first I day, you aren't worn any ho mm -hmm. even hungry. As long as it could be a liquid fast, you know, mm -hmm. drink something. Mm -hmm. I think you're st doing study of the criticism of the translation uh, should be interesting. Yep. I'm sure Brian is still, he's going to hear the rest of this after it's over with too. So he will, he will hear that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I missed that comment. Uh, I was um, uh, uh, juggling, um, tried to get everybody in. Uh, I have been, John says, I have been spoon fed so much. I got my Bible out in my hand yesterday, not the blue letter Bible online, but the book. It was like an electric blanket on a cold day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking about Joyce being in the hospital and being such a, a good witness. And hmm. we know that Sherry's the same thing. And I'm thinking, you know, very few people start the conversation with me in, in the hospital. And I'm reading my Bible, but it's this electronic Bible. They don't know. So I, I decided I'm going to start taking my Oxford in and yeah. opening it up, and yeah. they'll see my Bible. <laughs> even though you can't read it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't even read the tabs anymore. Mm. John says, Paul worked with my best friend when Paul was 20. My bestie is now teaching at Paul's dad's church. Awesome. Great. Amen. That's fantastic. Praise the Lord. I was fortunate to lead my friend to right division, and we have a blast. <laughs> that That's awesome. A, that is such a deal. Um, uh, I nicknamed, I'm nicknamed Paul the Hillbilly Preacher. <laughs> <laughs> or I nicknamed him Paul the Hillbilly Preacher. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, John says he is one. He speaks my language. Oh, and here's the, Joyce says, the cleaning crew loved the teachings I gave them on Right Division. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, I'll take cleaning crews. Absolutely. I'll right. take anybody you got. Uh, John says, my bestie uh, taught me to be full of grace and meekness and stop biting heads off. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, your bestie taught you that because Paul taught us that. Taught us all that same principle. Mm -hmm. Another of our friends we grew up with is an Adventist and, well, long talks and not so nice. Joel and friends are also teaching me to keep calm and carry on. Yep. <laughs> and this is what this is what Fellowship Bible taught me when I came back. I was full of depression and I'm there. The news was terrible. There was all these stuff going on and I'd come into this church and they're smiling, and they're happy, and they're singing praise songs, and they're hugging and kissing each mm -hmm. other, and yeah. that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. The life of the mature believer is full of joy, and you're full of peace also, regardless yeah. of what's going on around yeah. you. Um, yeah, I love, and I, I, I treasure that what that learning. Uh, Paul can be a little gruff, but no doubt preaches truth. That's awesome. Uh, uh, Al is in the house. Hey, How Al. you doing, brother? Uh, James, my other brother, and I didn't know of any grace teachers other than Feldick until four years ago. Yep. Not Feldick's a man, not a though. bad way to go. No. Uh, Joyce says people were blown away when I taught them that we will be replacing angels in heaven that get kicked <laughs> out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I still remember the first time that I was shown that in scripture by, um, um, Oh, the Satan's policy of evil guy. Yeah. Uh, uh yeah. James. No, no. How can my, I tell you, I'm, I'm really getting too old. My brain does uh, not work. The, well, uh, the alternative isn't good for us right now. You need to stay. Uh, just yeah, like but, uh, uh, it just blew my mind. Literally uh, blew my mind. I'm drawing a blank too, man. How am I? Keith how, Blades. Keith Blades. Oh, there you go. Yes. I was thinking of Keith Baxter Keith. And, and Keith Blades. I used to get yeah. them confused. I'm yeah, slow on go. the uptake, but you, <laughs> sometimes I get there. Uh, Rose, it's great to see you. Looky there, Look Amy there, Stewart, our sweet sister. Yeah, how are you? Amy in Canada. Uh, uh, Joyce says these were mostly black people who already go to church, so they were very open to my teachings. That's Amen. awesome. Amen. Um. Uh, let's see. When I learned of VI, I used it and it, it didn't taste right. Uh, Joyce says, I was stuck in the hospital for three, three weeks and I never missed an opportunity to share the gospel. You're beautiful. Amen. You're beautiful. 
Praise you. Lord. Um, uh, is Persis in today? I haven't seen her. Of course, uh, she, she has been in on a couple of uh, podcasts lately. She, um, oh, Robert Craig says mainly distinctions between the human spirit versus Holy Spirit, right? Mm, right. Yeah. Right. Big difference. Uh, the when it comes to the human spirit and uh, soul and the Holy Spirit, um, oftentimes a pneuma is used, and uh, and the and spirit can be used interchangeably between soul and spirit of right. man. Right. In Scripture, right. if I remember there's, correctly, there, there's a general sense in which the soul speaks to our identity, and the spirit speaks to our intellect, which makes sense to me because the the difference in and man and the rest of the animal creation is, is that breath that God breathed into man, which is the spirit of man, which I would say is an essence of God himself. Uh, yeah. Again, the, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Right. Searching, you know, to the innermost parts of the belly. So it's it's a part of that Romans 1 uh, innate, uh, intrinsic knowledge uh, of God Himself that God put in every person, so that so that no person was without excuse. Right, that's right. Right, yeah. you uh, beautifully said. Thank you, Pastor Charlie Duke says. Good morning from Alberta. Hey, Alberta. good morning to you. Wow, right division is growing more and more. Is this the fulfillment of the fullness of the Gentiles come in? Yeah, there's only sixty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We're tiny. We're tiny. Um, uh, Robert Craig says, John, I've heard that the potter's field where Judas was buried was called, I can't pronounce that, because of the red clay in it. Uh, this That word means field of blood. It's not mm -hmm. I don't remember Dama, that. Yeah, could be. Could be. Um, yeah, Ripplinger Museum. Uh, Brian is doing um, a series of videos on the built-in dictionary. I've seen the first four, I think. Uh, they're awesome. They are just awesome. And uh, he finally gets to the point where uh, by the time you get to the fourth video, he's really fed up with Ripplinger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he has encountered so many willful, intentional misquotations and errors yes. and false statements in yeah. her books. Mm. I mean, he's a King James advocate like everybody else, but she is just uh, – and he's, he's just finally – he's just done with her. Now, uh, has she kind of – slid down because I don't remember being bad in the beginning or um, I, I didn't think she was the thing with Gail. I suspect that nobody ever really, people just accepted what she wrote and they never really spent the time to yeah. check the quotes and the citations I, I like agree. Brian would do. Yeah. And, and he has discovered that in checking the quotations that she really, mm -hmm. she really butchers some quotes and she is right. really dishonest in a she number took, of places. Right. She took license. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, what, there's a lesson in that, uh, whether it's on the issue of preservation of the scripture or right division or any number of things. If, if you overstate your case, if you oversimplify your case, if you make statements that on 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 the face look good, but if you really hold them up to the light of day, you realize right. they're not right. really true. Right. It's it's going to take you to the point where. Number one, you're standing, you're not standing for truth. You're really standing against it. And number two, you're laying the foundation to destroy people's faith. Right. Because Absolutely. they, right. they, they, when they examine what you're saying in the light of day and they compare it to scripture themselves and they read the Bible and then they realize you're full of baloney. Right. And right. they, and they end up rejecting truth right. because of the way you presented it. Right. And, you know, Brian would, you know, it's, it doesn't demand that you have to agree with him on everything, but he just wants you to think critically about this whole subject and right. not just accept verbatim anything right. uh, Gail Ripplinger writes or anybody else for that matter, or right. even anything Brian right. says. And you use the word critical, and I'm going to say that's not to say that, that Brian or anybody that I know believes in textual criticism. No. Right, right, right. Great point. We, yeah. we are not textual critics. Right, right. But in any way, shape, or form. Right. It Amen. just means that we do understand when he uses that term, uh, verbatim identicality. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, that that's the point which leads me to the, the understanding of multiplicity of copies. Right. Be it, it's not that they were available, that it, they were, but it was that all the copies that people had access to 
were brought in and they determined through going through them and finding mm -hmm. mistakes and errors, right. which ones to keep. Mm -hmm. Right. The, um, uh, and that's not to say, I mean, Brian's as much a King James advocate as anybody, right. but let's just uh, be mm -hmm. intellectually honest about textual facts and other yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a matter, it's yeah. a question of right. intellectual honesty right. for him and not, not a matter, not a matter mm -hmm. of subverting anybody's ideas about the King James being yeah. the word of God that's for right. English speaking people. Well, that, and to me, there's, a deeper underlying truth that we realize from this, and I ask the question this, is the only way that God can have man do his will is for God to take control and make him an automaton. Mechanical. Mechanical. And control everything. Right. Or can a man actually be led of the Spirit, led by God, and still achieve his will? Yep. Right. And so we understand an in inspiration. I don't have a problem with me with mechanical and in, in, in context of, I don't, I don't of, of, of inspiration. I don't either. I don't either. But yeah, to no. assume that preservation works on the same principle as inspiration is, is wrong. Right. And when you go and you read the design of the multiplicity of copies and, and you see it demonstrated from, from cover to cover in your Bible and, and how God intended to preserve his word. Right. Um, Amen. Yes, you you have to have uh, respect for how God designed to do that. Yeah, this um, it seems like it's almost like uh, you know this the the sovereignty thing. It, the the way the Calvinist view sovereignty is the low view, but with Brian, you know, when it comes to the subject yes. of preservation, this yes. necessity of uh, um, originals only, this uh, insistence on verbatim identicality is the low view. Yeah. You have a greater yes. faith and yes. a greater appreciation yes. for the work of God when you take the higher view yes. of not insisting on verbatim identicality. Right. That's the thing. It's a great, it's a, it's a, a higher plane of faith in God and how he works, accepting the fact that you don't have to have verbatim identicality. Right. That's, that's, and that's a, that, that was for me when I, when he was making these cases and from this generation forever was just, um, he was challenging my faith, yeah. you know, cause I had, I had the low view growing up right. about, and those, and those ideas about preservation. Well, that's what we were I, taught. Yeah. 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 You know, and uh, to, what I really enjoy about inspiration is even though they were, you know, God was uh, involved in that process, he still allowed the writers to demonstrate their personalities, mm -hmm. their experiences, right. their... And yep. they were able to bring all that into uh, into their writings. I love that you said that. That's one of my favorite aspects of inspiration: the right. fact that they these writers can write in their own voice and their own words, and, so, and yet it's still truth. The yeah. truth that God wanted them to share. Right. That's amazing. And yeah. I love the First Corinthians seven when the, Paul said, "You know, God just allowed me to say this. I mean, this is truly coming from me. You know, and yeah. uh, I love that." Yeah. A. Hannah says, uh, the problem with looking into these, is this not Al Hannah? Or is this a different Hannah? Is this? I she, don't know. Um, it is? just reads differently than the way I would expect yeah. Al or Sherry to speak. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I could be Al Mentor or Sherry Hannah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the problem with looking into these magical letter, number, math, and number anomalies in English gets destroyed once you have a different edition. Now you have to have the absolute correct edition, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, which goes back to, um, uh, for example, what Brian had been talking about with the uh, Cambridge uh, only uh, position. I mean, you have the Cambridge and Oxford printings of the 1769 edition all do not have verbatim identicality That's with right. one another. And mm -hmm. at least so the implication being at least one of the Cambridge or the Oxford printings of the King James does not represent the preserved word of God. Um, and that is one of the. One of the aspects of verbatim identicality that David and Brian address in this in this new book that I love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that Let me I love. say that's taking it too far. Um, but that's an excellent point. I mean, you know, there was never two texts that actually agreed with one another completely and totally verbatimly, uh, and and so you understand that. And what do we do when we preach? You know, we read that and then we, 
we dynamically, I guess, give you our opinion of what it's saying. Right. So what happens there? I mean, right. which is, and it, we, we don't do it either. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a dangerous position. <laughs> Uh, Romans three twenty two. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, Woo-hoo. unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no, no difference. difference. Um, Alex says, uh, I literally was thinking the same thing about the King James Bible Museum videos. Nothing more than but tabloid style superstitions and a bunch of wrong right. conclusions based yeah. on printer errors. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The Scrabble thing is all you need to see. <laughs> now where can i see that like i'll play it for you afterwards it's unbelievable i just oh it made my head hurt watching that um uh, fernando says uh, shares the esv translation of romans 322 the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ yeah. for all who believe for there is no distinction mm. oh man Ooh, see, that makes me that makes me it. hurt yeah um Alex says, uh, I have always uh, been suspicious of people who use these types of decoder ring style explanations when it comes to defending the King James Bible. I love that decoder ring style explanations. Yes, that's a fantastic description of what was going on there with the Scrabble video. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Let's see here. Well, again, I object to the idea that that the King James Bible needs to be defended. I think it defends itself. Yeah, absolutely. Internal evidence. Yeah. What God says he's yeah. going to do with his yeah. word. I shall preserve them from this generation forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, the words. John Snodgrass says, and to think that Paul suffered five times that whipping 40 stripes, save one with the cat of nine tails that yep. ripped the flesh away from the bone and just cuts deep. Mm-hmm. Uh, horrific. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's, you know, when you have the, I think Paul died oft. Yeah. I think I don't think there's any uh, there's any possibility that Paul could have survived all of that torture. No. Um it's just there's just no way. Mm-hmm. There's no way. Um Robert Craig says a church at Rennes Le Chateau in southern France had paintings depicting the stations of the cross for which there is not one bit of scriptural basis. Um, I can't remember how many stations there were, but that was ludicrous. Uh, I have not heard that. Uh, Stations for the cross? Well, yeah, it it went all the way around. I don't remember how many there were, but it it all came from the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, really? Uh, James Watkins says, so you wouldn't agree that numbers mean something in the King James? I very much agree. uh, What they're talking about is different than uh, the meaning of numbers in Scripture. What they're talking about is a guy using Scrabble (laughs) and B-I-B-L-E actually would come to 1611, you know, and then saying, see, this is why the King James is, you know, the God's word for us today. That yeah. kind of decoder ring yeah. style yeah. defense of the King James is just, it's just nonsense. It's numerology run amok. Yeah. But numerology, there is meaning in scripture for right. numerology. And one of my yeah. favorite Bollinger books is number in scripture. Yeah. Totally recommend that. Yeah. And I love the study of numbers mm-hmm. in scripture. Um, uh, John Snodgrass, uh, he quotes, uh, Romans five, five and hope make it not a shame. Oh, okay. I think we covered that earlier. Um, yeah. One and three are very, they have huge meanings in scripture without a doubt. Hey, we got Janice in the house. How you doing? Happy good Friday. Yes. Happy good Friday to you. Yeah. Um, I love the events of Passion Week. I really enjoyed my time with uh, with Hal, and uh, well, and of course, it's awesome having Freddie Bear here today. But I'm just—it uh, was awesome being able to look at some of those old, uh, some of those stories on Passion Week. I think it's just so yeah. phenomenal these fi- these epic showdowns between the Lord and the Sadducees mm-hmm. and the Pharisees. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the greatest things about having an Easter service because most of us as as preachers are going to get up on what we call resurrection Sunday, which is, which is a perfectly good descriptive term. And we're pretty much going to say the same thing every time. 
And I, I would like to think, I mean, you, you don't reinvent that wheel. That is, that is the, at least the one day of year that you, that you go back and you look at those events and you look at the details of that particular week. And I, I personally think that most of the listeners would be disappointed if we didn't get up there mm-hmm. because it, it's, it's not a question of, of declaring something new. Mm-hmm. It is no. a question of reinfirming a court that, if not the core truth of our Bible, I which is resurrection. Amen. I love the song. Tell me the old, old story. I mean, I just love to get there. Plus it is, I mean, let's face it. It's a, it's a holiday. There'll be people who'll mm. be at church on Sunday that, mm. that you won't see again until maybe Christmas. Mm. And the, the point is, if you miss that opportunity uh, to talk about mm. what's really important on uh, resurrection day or is mm. the, Easter, and there's nothing wrong with that word either because yeah. it's in our Bibles. Uh, the uh, the idea, though, uh, just, man, what a wonderful story to tell and remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vincenti uh, uh, says, do you think the Pope and some churches doing feet washing is comical? Uh, it had cultural significance back when Jesus did it. It was a lowly job. Doing it today seems to be more about display Maybe I'm being too cynical. Uh, what would the modern day equivalent of feet washing be? Holy kiss. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to be said about that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, this will get how weeping. So I'm going to try to see if we can get how weeping. I mean, honestly, how if you think about the Lord Jesus Christ mm-hmm. putting a towel around his waist, yep. getting on his, his knees, knees. Mm-hmm. And washing yep. the feet of his own disciples. Mm-hmm. Does that not mm-hmm. just move you to your yeah. core, make your heart just overwhelmingly yeah. stirred with if just unbelievable? Cry, I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> and, and is it yeah. not the most amazing yeah. thing ever? I mean, if you mm-hmm. if that does not blow your mind, then you've got too big a fuse mm-hmm. in your fuse what box. A right? demonstration <laughs> of love that yeah. he had for his disciples. Yeah. Hal well, talked about preached on that once and wept like a baby. It's one my favorite sermon yeah well again that he said he did it as an example yeah but you remember what peter's reaction was when he you're not washing you're, your feet. you're, gonna you're not it. gonna watch and he said well you you, you you can't have anything to do with me you, if i you don't. got exactly and he said all right wash my head and well, my hands wash, <laughs> wash the whole thing you know? exactly you know? my booty you can get my booty if you want and you can wash have, my booty that's right have at it and there is nothing wrong with the example <laughs> no. of, of washing feet. The problem is, 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 is the problem is religion because everything about what we read in the scripture has been, you know, today they, we, they use the term weaponized. They take the truth of scriptures and they religionize it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's, it's like the, the, Passages we were reading about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, you know, they they do these things for a show, but they're really nothing more than whited sepulchers and they're just full of rottenness. Exactly. And and so, you know, the idea of of the Pope and and religious leaders washing feet doesn't impress me because I, I understand where it's coming from. Right. Uh, the um now when the Lord now we uh Wednesday night uh, I have a message on the upper room I did a deep dive into the washing of the feet and uh, one of the books I was reading there is of course in the washing of the feet he is it is an illust- he is by example showing them by example the humility that they're to have yeah and the the uh, heart of servitude toward one another that's the primary meaning there. Mm-hmm. And Baker had also suggested that there was a meaning here involved with the the walk of mm-hmm. the believer because yeah. of the exchange between Peter and the Lord. You can't, you know, there there is, you know, fellowship requires a you know good walk for mm-hmm. them, for the Jews in that economy. Mm-hmm. Now, so and I love I actually love that point. Did you ever notice after the Lord did this example for them in the upper room, you never read about them washing each other's feet in the book of Acts after that. You never yeah, you never read about that, them doing that, that, that to each other, nor do they talk about it in the Hebrew epistles. You don't read about it. why? Because there's a spiritual principle, a mm. lesson being taught 
through that illustration yeah. of the washing of the feet. And it's that that spiritual lesson that they were taught that they understood. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. in part, it was not just humility, having that mm -hmm. servant's heart, but they mm -hmm. were also to help each other with their, to maintain that righteous walk based right. on the word of the Lord. All right. Um, and um, yeah. that's the point I love about right. it. Well, he made the points. He that is first would be last, and he that will be last, last will, be first. will right. be first. And, right. and the servant is the one that becomes the master. Right, exactly. Right, mm. which is what the, he had to teach them after they get into an argument about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Yes. Which is just, just, just that's about as immature as you could possibly yeah. be in front of the Lord. But as the mamas, you know, they, they really, you know, want to exalt their son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Mm. And uh, and I, I love that point. I think there, there was some I, I th there was some credence to the thought that uh, the Lord, you know, he talked about being clean and you have no need to be washed again. Save your feet. Yeah. Is what he said before Peter re rebuked him or yeah. no, after after Peter, after Peter said, you're not washing my He makes that point. You, you don't once you're washed, you don't need to be washed again, except except your feet. Mm -hmm. Well, what does he mean by that? He's talking about. Position versus practice. He's talking about justification versus practical righteousness in your walk. You know, you you have once you're clean, you've been cleaned through the word, which means you've been saved. Mm -hmm. And even for the disciples and the, the saints in the uh, time of the Gospels, once they were justified, they had eternal security. There was no need for them to be washed again. Right. Except their feet, which had to do with their walk, mm. and the there you you are you have the Lord helping you with your walk through the Word, illustrated by Him washing the feet. Right, and uh, mm. I, I like that point. That yeah. makes Amen. sense to me. Amen. Right. Um, Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't. I didn't. That I got that from Baker. I didn't. Yeah. That's not. Well, again, I I think if you take Philippians two, yes, without the backstory, right. I, I think it detracts from it. Uh, you know, let this mind be in, in, you. in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, it, it's written in the context of esteeming Other better than others better than, than themselves. Right. Uh, that's the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. You know, and, and if I want to see that in the flesh, if you want to say, what does it look like? I go back and I read the Gospels and he showed me exactly right. what it looks like. Right. Right. Amen. And this um, attitude of humility and servitude would also coincide beautifully with that new commandment he had given them to love one another, even as he had loved them, it, which, which was not it was a love, a, 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 not a new form of love, but a love that would be sacrificial. You love that person so much, you're willing to lay down your life for him. And if you're going to spend your life washing his feet and helping him with his walk, you are in that continual mindset of loving that person that much that you would also be willing to sacrifice yourself for them. Um, I love that story. I love the upper room. Can you, I, I just I am passionate week. Some of my uh, some of the greatest exchanges of dialogue in all the Bible, especially between the Lord and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I just I love it. <laughs> Um. Uh, uh, Charlie Duke uh, says, you "Can you define walking in the spirit?" I love that question. Um, I think walking in the spirit has to be. You're you're behaving in a way. You've come under the full influence of the spirit and what the spirit has taught you about how you're supposed to live. So you 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 you're allowing you're yielding yourself to the influence of the spirit in the sense of you're 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 giving your life over to the will of God taught to you by the spirit and that you are uh, doing what you trying to fulfill those principles of God in the daily outliving of your faith through the spirit and through that the, I, through the yeah, spirit, spirit help me yeah. because and I know it's a very difficult thing and I struggle with it all the time because. If I purpose or say to myself when I get get up in, today, I'm going to, I am going to walk in the spirit. Yeah. Well, who's that coming from? Right. Because the spirit is going to do the right thing. He'll do it. Our challenge is, and it's not mechanical in any way. Our challenge is just to let the spirit live his life through us. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult. I huh? I don't know because you can't put it in a word. You can't you can't give them a list of one, two, three, four, because that's mm -hmm. a fleshly response. 
Right. And he also relates it to knowledge in so many cases. I mean, it's, it's, is it possible to do things that you don't know? Well, the Holy Spirit is not going to manipulate our, our, our minds and, and our lives in that sense. Uh, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, we read that it becomes a part of us. And, and so there is this uh, symbiosis, but with, with the very life of God, um, you know, <laughs> I think of Philippians chapter one, he said, I pray that your love may abound yet more, more and more in knowledge and all judgment. He said that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, Amen. which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Well, how does the Lord Jesus Christ produce the fruits of righteousness in, in the believer? Does he do it through his word? Yes. Does he do it through the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do, does he do it through his own life? Yes. Does he, does he, do, 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 did he do it through the power of God the Father? Yes. Yes. Sure. Yep. All right. So I like the That's an unusual how question. It wasn't two Do options. Two options. <laughs> 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 he had yeah. Lots of options there. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Kate Anderson's in the house. Hey there. And look at this guy. Look at this crazy man. Ah, oh, my beautiful brother. My beautiful brother. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. It seems like each time I have a, a couple minutes to get on here, it's, we have a rainy, yucky day here, and it's like 40 degrees. So I don't know. It must be something about the red heifer coming or something. I don't know. What's going on? Do you, what's your? Uh, you have any thoughts about anything that had been said this morning? Uh, any thoughts that it couldn't contain the, a whole podcast? So, <laughs> 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 but I, I was reminded. Uh, you know, I I posted that about the Ripplinger Museum, and uh, uh, I almost wrote the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, but it would be about the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Ripplinger's Believe It or Not. Yeah, yeah. That's Believe It or Not. Oh, I, yeah, love that. Yeah. I have to I have to check out that guy's video about the Scrabble because uh, I was reminded I I'd read New Age Bible versions, you know, many years ago. And, uh, you know, my conclusion of that, it was like it was the gutter read book that you got to have. And my conclusion conclusion of that back then was this woman's a nut job. Um, and uh, and the thing I remember most I was just reminded about today is that she said that. NASV uh, was 1611, so that means the NASV is is wrong, and uh, I I don't like the NASV because it's never been called the NASV. It's always been the NASB. Right. She had to change Bible to version in order to get at that to fit her Scrabble mode. So that yeah. was just one of the things, and and so I'm I'm gonna have to check out that video of the the Bible uh, Museum guy and. And uh, it seems like there was a whole bunch of those teachers that would that would uh, stoop down to human logic and yeah. uh, and and make up things about about Bibles and everything rather than the text itself. You would, love that. you would love that Scrabble video. It was it was oh, awful. man. It was awful. Um, uh, Davy says, what is the difference between the teaching of Les Feldick and the mad bad crew? Um, we, I have, we agree with Les on all the major points. And the thing about Les that I, I personally appreciate is that he really understood identification. Yes, he did. And, and <laughs> I, I have gone through, uh, I have gone, I had gone through everything he had said about Romans six, seven, and eight. And uh, I loved a lot of what he said. I think uh, Les Feldick is a, is arguably a better education than what I got growing up with CR Stam. Uh, because he understood identification, and I, you can't understate how significant identification is, and that's where I really find my appreciation uh, for him. I, you know, when it comes to the gospel, identification, and right division, uh, we are uh, on the same page with him on everything. Uh, there were, I think he was an Acts thirteen guy, and that. Oh, was he? That's what I think. Yeah, and there were things but that, that's okay. There were minor minor points that I remember disagreeing with him on, but I don't yeah. remember what they were. But they were not. There was nothing. It you mm -hmm. know, it was very very minor stuff. Yeah. Well, again, listening to what you say, uh, Cornelius Stam did teach ident identification. The thing is, though, it was further down the list. 
uh, further up the list was right division. Right. And uh, of course, you can't get to identification without right division. Right. So some people got hung up on that. But, you know, to us, right division is the vehicle that takes us to the understanding yeah. of, of identity. And right division opens the door to the understanding of identity. Yeah. You, you can't get there without it. But once you're in that room and you walk through that door, you don't get you don't turn around and focus on the door that brought you into the room. <laughs> you, 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 you focus on on the room itself and, yeah. and what's there. And, uh, and I think that's the difference because uh, Les spent more time talking about what's in the room rather than focusing as much on the door that you walk through to get there. See, the uh, whole thing is, you know, it had to be a guy like C.R. Stam's focus because that's what needed to be done at that time. Yes. Mm -hmm. But now that that's yeah. been established, we yeah. preach right division. But as Howard just just said, you know, we that's not the ultimate mm -hmm. end of what no. Paul had for us. Mm -hmm. It was the beginning. And to stay there and to focus on that completely, um, that would be a waste of our time because yeah. we're standing on the shoulders of men who had already established right. that. Uh, I would also praise uh, Les's uh, tone uh, yeah, compared to Stam's too. Stam yeah. was a fighter, yeah. and uh, he could be he could be tough. Well, he and, was the Dutchman. Uh, it was, you know, he, he was a fighting Dutchman. That's right. And all uh, you have to do is read the controversy, and then you'll understand how Stam approached. Uh, he was Stan was very Sam can be very difficult. Les Feldick was beautiful. Yeah. He was beautiful in tone. Uh, the way he treated people, loved him. I loved him for that too. Yeah, uh, well, those minor differences are, are of of we're all in the same ship. You know, we might yes. have our uh, yeah. you know rearrange the deck chairs in a different place or fold it up in some some cases, <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, we're still in the same boat. You know, so, that's right. Uh, Amen. Uh, yeah. Well, we're all in the same boat. There's just some people we, went, we wouldn't want them driving the boat because they <laughs> <laughs> now I can think of one with a first name of our and a last name with our. Yeah. Uh, Norma says, I'm going to share this beautiful comment from Norma. That love is what I learned when I came to Grace. I find myself smiling even though I'm going through the things I'm going through. Yeah, That's, the Amen. That's the point. Amen. That's the point. Yeah. What is it that constrains us? You know, it, it's the love yeah. of God, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Keith, uh, uh, they're talking about Keith Blades. Uh, Keith Blades taught sonship edification that a lot of people uh, uh, choke on, he says. Yeah, not a fan. Yeah. Uh, how does one know if he's not getting into work? Say that again. How does one know if he's not getting into work? Well, see, that's the question. Getting into works. Well, yeah, you know, the thing is, why did I do what I just did? And mm. that, who wants to know that? Oh, yeah, the right, flesh yeah. wants to know that. Right. Am I am I doing it right? Am yeah. I am I getting good works? Mm. And if, yeah. when that question's in the forefront of your mind, just say no, because yeah. that whole idea comes from our flesh. Well, who wants yeah. control? Yeah. He wants to be able to do these things. Yep. For the it's, glory, it's a useless question. Yes. Yeah. You it's know. a useless question. If you try and ex examine your motiv your motivation and, and doing things, I mean, who wants to say, well, <laughs> I'm doing this for the wrong motivation? Uh, you know, Paul, I, and Paul I, love, even has I, I love 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He, yeah, said, you know, he said, it's a very small thing that I be judged of you uh, uh, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not, not my, my own, own self. self. And that's yeah. a good yeah. lesson to learn. That's a very good lesson because mm -hmm. if, if you're going to sit on your hands and until you think that you've ascertained whether or not you have the right motivation, motivation. to do what's yeah. right, you're missing the boat. That's the reason he said, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is, is committed. You still me. need to go out and do it. So he said, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to do what's right. Even though I'm not really sure about my motivation in doing it. I, I know people who have been completely sidelined and now no longer even come to church because they could not settle the question was even, am I going to church, you know, through the spirit or through my flesh? What's my motivation yeah. for even going to church? And, and they're completely, wasted as far as it comes to the ministry now 
Um, yeah, sadly, that happens uh, too much too often. People get uh, they don't have they don't realize that the work is a, a fruit of their yeah. salvation, their justification. But so That's many right. people put it as the root of it. it. I must do this. I need to check right. a box in order to fulfill God's will. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we we make the statement often we're not under a, a performance based acceptance system. But the flip side of that coin is that we are definitely on a grace based performance system. That's right. Amen. That's right. That's right. That. Yeah. Yeah. Grace has to be the motivation no matter what, you know, so. Uh, Charlie Duke says, did Jesus die spiritually and go to hell? Uh, well, I would, I, I have, uh, argued a long time. I, I, th he didn't go to the, the hot side of hell as uh, John Snodgrass mentioned here, but, um, he suffered on that cross in a physical and spiritual way. And I think, uh, Psalm 22 to some, to a certain degree pulls back the spiritual curtain and you realize that his soul had also suffered beyond comprehension when he was on that cross. Yeah. It was a it was a suffering of body and soul when he was there. He suffered more than any being who had ever existed in the history of creation, and that was what was required in order to sufficiently pay for the consequence of of sin. And uh, I I so but then after it was over with, he said, "It is finished," and that was it. There was no more suffering for him. He did spend three days, three nights in Sheol. He preached to the spirits in prison. I think after that speech was probably really short <laughs> mm -hmm. to those angels. And then he hung out with the saints. Mm -hmm. um, and it was totally awesome. Well, the Bible but, says for the wages of sin is death. Right. It doesn't say the wages of sin is death and going to the hot side. That's right. Uh, but, go ahead, brother. That Jesus uh, was physically D-E-A-D -E dead. His body was dead. <laughs> uh, Anita says, I used to kneel and pray often at the 12 stations of the cross, never went in front of Virgin Mary. It was about the suffering road to the cross. Unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable. I well, station. Fire station one time, and the outcome wouldn't have been good. <laughs> Anita, uh, Amy Stewart says, foot washing indicates that no job is beneath me. Such a great point. I go. love that. Yeah. Oh. Hey, let me, that was one of the things I, I was thinking of earlier, too, was uh, the foot washing. And the modern equivalent of foot washing is the, the emphasis on small groups. Yeah. Yeah, almost all salvation almost comes through through participating in, in the small groups in the mega churches. Uh, so the group can't be any bigger than 13 people in a room? I, I don't know. I, I, I think they're, <laughs> that's a good place to start, right? So <laughs> we would rejoice. Yeah, if we had 13 in a room, we'd be, yeah, we'd all be happy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Robert Craig says it was, if it wasn't the spirit of Jesus that died, he gave that up to the father. It was only his body. His human soul went to paradise along with that of the repentant thief. This is the main reason I believe that soul, uh, that the soul survives death. Very good. Amen. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, for sure. The washing of the feet is a demonstration of love. Yes, that too. That too. And that's the reason I can't get out of Genesis almost all the time when it, he breathed into man, the breath of life and man became a living soul. And that soul is going to live somewhere for it never dies. It'll go somewhere forever. Um, Rick and Debs was very kind. They said, Julia Wednesday night explaining, uh, of the week, the week was excellent. That, uh, uh, the the best lines from Wednesday night came from Charles Baker. <laughs> I'll freely admit that, uh, and I did, and I gave him plenty of. Speech. But there's a, he did a book called Understanding the Gospels. It's one of my all time mm. favorites. He goes through the Gospels in chronological order, and I'm, I'm I'm I love it so much. I'm tempted to do that myself. I'm going to see nice now. Just go through the 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 whole life of uh, earth, the earthly ministry of Christ in chronological order, and then do do the Book of Acts. That would be that would be pretty pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know how but much thank you plagiarisms very much. involved in our our preach, preaching and teaching. <laughs> we plagiarize all I, the time. If I if I speak somebody else's line, Brian Brian will catch it. <laughs> and I I had better give citations and quotations if I'm quoting footnotes. anybody. We need yeah. cliff notes and footnotes. But there are times when somebody says something brilliant, but I don't like the way they say it, and I'll rewrite it. Uh, that does happen. Um, uh, uh, John Snodgrass says, and if, and if we walk in the spirit, we are safe. But who walks in the spirit 24-7? Uh, 
We ought to, spirit, but we don't. Yeah. The spirit walks 24 7, but we don't. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, thank you very much for that, Joyce. Titus 3 5 is our washing of feet and mind. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Amen. That is true. Mm -hmm. The washing of regeneration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the, the spirit renewing your mind, basically, yeah. uh, through the word. Yeah. When Paul says the washing of the spirit, through the word, you know, washing. I can't remember the exact quote, but I, that, that's the whole point. The word does it. Uh, Robert Craig says, for many years, less labored in his teachings, unaware that there were any others in the USA teaching in like manner. And it's amazing. He was on, what was that TV channel he was on? Um, I mean, it is 24 hours of garbage, except for that one hour of less One time. hour. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it is a miracle it was yeah. even on, yeah. you know, and... Um, uh, we were talking about him, uh, so Sonia and I and a few others here, we were all talking about Les on Wednesday night and she, uh, after the service, and um, she's, I, my, the thing that's, that uh, stuns me about Les is you could call that number and you, he would answer the phone. <laughs> Les would pick up the phone. She called yeah. him and asked him about which Bible she should use, yeah. you know, and he gave the reasons for the King James and gave, gave her somebody else that she could talk to, but. Yeah, you just call the number. He's sitting there at the desk, and he'll pick up the phone and talk to you. That's amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. Didn't he realize that? Didn't yeah. he realize oh, that? unbelievable. And he's yeah. a sweetheart. Well, we have to say the influence he had on, on our assembly. I mean, there is a great number of people uh, because he would graciously, yeah. graciously refer people to our church. Mm -hmm. All right, there's a lot of uh, some questions here about the Scrabble video. Hey, oh, Cliff has it. Hey, Cliff, can you put that link in the live chat? That would be awesome. Uh, I, I would did. have no problem with that, huh? I, I he did? He okay, did. great. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, brother. Uh, I'm still catching up here. Uh, Lourdes hey, says, if Cliff can fine. send that to me, that would be great. If uh, you could send me an instant a private message, I'd, oh, well, I'd like to get that. After it's over with, I'll, I'll send it to you, yeah. And, you know, Brian sent the <laughs> – what was the, the – I forget the name of some some Adam Sandler movie, and there's some question, and the guy says, "Yeah, you know, uh, we the, the the that's the dumbest thing we ever. We are all now dumber because we had to listen to you say that to us." <laughs> yeah, that was Brian's reaction to the Scrabble video. It's hilarious. Um, in any event, sorry, Ludus, Ludus, our sweet sister down there in Puerto Rico says, "Please pray for my brother's granddaughter that lives in Florida and has been reported disappeared since three days ago." Oh my, Unbelievable! Oh my, oh my! Oh my. Hmm. Absolutely, we'll pray for him and your your entire family. Um, Vincenti, um, how to bring every thought and action into obedience of Christ without self-examination? Well, at the same time, Paul does say, judge all things. There is nothing wrong with self-examination in the sense of making sure that your life is living in, 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 uh, in, in, lock, in lockstep with the will of God. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the whole idea of wisdom is to know what God's will is, and then you figure out how to apply that principle to the details of yeah. your life. Right. So you're, be, you're not judging you're, the motivation. You're right. judging the behavior. Right. Exactly. And that's the point. You're ju judging the person. You're not judging the motivation. You're merely judging the behavior. Um, and uh, I, mean, right. I can't. I can't say how is is this. Uh, he's not this and this because he's. He, he, his life has already been judged at Calvary. He's already as righteous as, as Christ. It's a matter of, yeah. of the uh, sanctification of his walk. Right. You know, Paul says, examine hey, hey. yourself that you be in the faith. You know, right. that, and that it starts with that. Our examination is have, right. first starts with have we trusted Christ. Right. Um, and uh, uh, bringing Sorry, every Bob. thought into captivity and the obedience of Christ is, I think, the, 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 the key to that is just having the words of Christ dwelling in you richly. And you've got this rich supply of Bible verses in your mind <laughs> so that when your mind goes in the wrong direction, you go, yeah, stop that, Joel. Remember this verse? You remember Amen. Ephesians 432? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you need yeah. to change your thinking back into this direction. Yeah, the, it, the, I think is, if Amy, is Amy Stewart still in the chat? Or, uh, I think of this, of uh, fog. Yeah. Focus on grace. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Simple focus. Look at to the grace of God and how how that measures up rather than your own self. Yeah. So. 
Uh, Amen. You know, Vincini makes a point here. Constant extreme examination of my intent and desires lined up against the pure holiness and perfection of God has been my biggest source of growth. Uh, how can you repent without self-honesty? Can you turn away from what you're afraid to examine in earnest? I would suggest now there, there is uh, there's value in all of that. No, no question about it. There's value there and there's value in you know, comparing what you're doing with the word of God. But I would it, r- rather than be, I would not be so much focused on the mistakes as much as focusing on the will of God, focusing on heavenly things, you know, it's Philippians 3.13, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before. The intent of the focus, the, the focus should be, what is the will? How do I do it? What do I look like? Next time I'm going to do it this way, okay. you know? Right. It, is, it is it is moving forward, looking up at all, at all times. And right. if we if if our if our focus is judgmental yeah. about that, that it will wear mm. you out. Right. There was there was um uh, the um, uh, Todd Friel had a video. I we almost talked about it on a podcast. Was talking about how you know sin and I forget that Paul Washer guy. The poor guys. The, his face just looks like he has spent half his life weeping over the things he's done. He's miserable. Absolutely miserable. Now there is, there can be godly sorrow for some sins and that's a perfectly natural thing to do. But let's not forget that the, the sign of spiritual maturity is joy, a life of joy. And when you make a mistake, It, you don't have to go through this process of beating yourself up, apologizing, crying to the Father, all this stuff. Right. It is if you if you accept Paul as your apostle, it is a matter of Philippians three thirteen. Right. You put that mistake behind you, and you keep mm-hmm. moving forward, looking right. up, forgetting those things that are behind, and reaching forth unto those things that are before. Right. Godly is, and godly sorrow is a process of repentance, of changing your mind right. about right. what right. you're doing. Right. It starts with with godly sorrow. Right. right. Yeah. They. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just I just want to insert into that Please turning do. away is not repentance. Right? Amen. Three repentance is a change of mind. Amen. In the Bible, if you want to look for illustrations of repentance, it's God that does the most repenting of anybody. Exactly. He's not turning away from <laughs> exactly. sin or, or or anything. Exactly. He changes his mind. Exactly. And and so Preach people it. have this idea that that repentance is is a work that we do. No, it's not. That's right. It's a change mm. in our thinking. That's right. That's right. There goes I love that point. That yeah. causes us to make different choices. Right. Everybody out there in Christendom is telling you, you got to repent means you need to be sorry for your sins. You need to cry. Yeah. When did God ever sin when he repented in the Old right. Testament? You know, hey, I love that has, anybody point. Ever played, has anybody ever played the uh, whack-a-mole game? <laughs> at the parks or whatever. I, I, I always use that that example if as yeah. as find so many teachings you have to repent of this particular sin and that particular sin and and i i think of it as like that whack-a-mole first it comes up and eventually you can't keep up so you just drop out you know and that's what that's what i picture that type of uh ideology slash theology uh it it borders it doesn't border it is uh, actually the the calvinist doctrine of, of perseverance of the faith of the saints mm-hmm. rather you know mm-hmm. it's uh it, it'll cause one to fall out you know and uh you know get off the hamster wheel you're on and 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 drop away from the faith so Love yeah. that. uh charlie duke says any ideas what the gifts are in ephesians 4 8 ephesians 4 8 wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high he led captivity, captivity. captive and gave gifts unto men yeah that's an easy one. Just read yeah, the rest. Keep reading. Of the Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave some apostles and some prophets and, yep. and pastors and teachers. And so in my written word that I used to be able to read, it was on the next column. It, you know, yeah. you just got to read that far to get yeah. to it. Yes. The word gave. That's right. Gave and gift. Yeah. They, go, they go together. So, yep. Uh, James but says, I, seems I opened up a can of worms. No, you didn't, brother. It's all good. Loved it. Amen. I'm glad you did, brother. I, I need worms. to check out at this point. So I figured I'd uh, get the chance uh, to drop up in. So I could do this with you all day, honestly, yeah, Bob. Yeah. It's phenomenal having you here. And, I love it when you join and don't go away because we're going to make fun of you soon. You <laughs> well, yeah, well I'll, I'll turn back on and listen to what I missed already and then, then <laughs> <laughs> put, uh, 
It's yeah, the fear they'll, of they'll be hell to the punch. It's uh, you can handle, you can stand being with me for all time, but I don't know if I could handle being with you all that time. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. I could. I think I drive you crazy before long. So uh, I think we'd have too much fun, brother. You take really good care of yourself. Tell your family we say hi. Amen. I will. And on when I go back out in the rain. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. All God right. bless you. Have a great Easter, and I'm not afraid to say it because it Amen. is not the parents' poster. So, uh, Amen. Well, enjoy it. Everything. Say hi to your families and everybody else for me as well. So, we Amen. Will. Praise the Lord. All right, brother. Take good care. Oh, you had something there, brother? No, no. I just said on. Onward. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, could, I couldn't resist. Soldier. I love you, man. Take care. <laughs> uh, onward, Christian soldier, I guess is what he was going to yeah. say. Um, uh, I can see why some say this, but I don't know the margin of my Bible. It did wear me out and it hurt, and I went through it and came out the other side with peace. Right. Praise and you Lord. just remember the all those sins were already paid for. Mm -hmm. Christ already died and suffered for those sins. He yeah. knew what those sins were going to be before he ever did it. Yeah. And he paid for those sins on that cross. And the point is, is it is now that the sin issue has already been addressed by Calvary. How are you going to live your life? Mm -hmm. Are you going to live it like the saint God made you in Christ? That moment you got saved, yeah. because now it's just a matter of aligning your earthly walk with your heavenly identity, yeah. knowing who you are in Christ and living in light of that, which is all, it's yeah. mental now. Yeah. And and the and the decision to make is send a weight that you're going to carry around with you, or, or are you going to just take and lay it aside because you understand that it was taken care of? Amen. It's, this is why you walk and live with joy. I'm sorry. For that's that. right. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm just a guest, <laughs> but it's just like once you've understood right division and you and you open that door, you don't, as I said, turn around, keep looking at the door. Right. Once you've trusted Christ as your Savior, that's over, and you don't have to keep looking back, try to experience right. that again. It's right. done, and you move on. Right. And this is the thing. Maybe, and uh, here I have uh, Vincenti, if you see, there's the Empowered by His Grace is this book over here. And we also have a free PDF you can download from our church's website if you're interested. In the in in uh, in this book, it is we we cover what God made you in Christ that moment you believed, and it is crucial doctrine to know who you are in Christ, what you are. You are in God's mind, dead, buried, and risen with His Son. That's Romans six three and four. The old man, the old Jew, everything you were in Adam, crucified with Christ. On in uh, Romans six six, yep. and he is as Bob Picard would say, D E A D, -A -D dead. Yeah. The old Jew is dead and gone. Reckon it so, yeah. and then you also reckon the fact that you have been literally freed from the power and the bondage of sin. Reckon it so. You know, you reckon as true what God already tells you about yourself, and then you live in light of who you are, which is a matter of renewing your mind, allowing the Word of God, to, the words of the Lord, to dwell in you richly especially the epistles of Paul, and you adjust, you re adjust your thinking, and then you begin to take these principles that, the, that God teaches you, and you figure out how to apply them to the details of your life. You know, I love that D-E-A-D, -E Dad. I, I remember the, uh, the Patterson boys. Um, the, the young one, you know, he, he really loved that D-E-A-D, -E Dad. Brother Derek's having a three-way bypass today. Yeah, so we pray for him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. is he really? Yeah. 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 Oh, all right. Uh, Derek Patterson and uh, Ludus. Uh, we'll keep them in mind for um, uh, for the prayer today. Did you drink a whole pot of coffee this morning, John? I don't think he needs coffee to be like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else? Uh, Charlie Duke, so powerful. I think most Christians are so beat up, they don't know how to live in the Spirit. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. And this is what get, what gets me about some of those Calvinist videos, that they are just so sad looking. So they spent their life crying bitter tears yep. for every mistake they've made. Yep. That's not God's will. No. Mm -hmm. Um, don't get me started. Uh, hey, how, how do we get that free gift to eternal life? <laughs> it's my turn. How about Freddie Baird? Then we'll have, we'll have Hal close definitely. in prayer. Let's, yeah, okay. Well, the idea of eternal life, and I tell you, when we think about that, you you know, uh, especially in light of 
Easter, Resurrection Sunday we're talking about, when you look at the, the content of 1 Corinthians 15, you can't get away from that. It says, Paul said, as he says, I delivered unto you that which I also received. And he's going to receive exactly what the process is. How that Christ died for our sins, take away for the wages of sin is death. It's been, it's been. That he was buried. And, you know, we go through the process and understand that. But what is it? We don't, we don't rejoice that Christ had to physically be nailed to the cross. We don't really focus on, you know, the fact that he was buried and his body was put in a tomb. And what do we really, what is really, does that lead us to? And that is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and then rose again. I mean, yeah. that's a triumphant statement that says Christ paid the price of sin. Amen. And he didn't have any sin. Amen. So it wasn't his sins yeah. he was paying for. Yep. He was paying for my sins and the sins of the whole world. Amen. And when you say there was put no limitation on who Christ died for, it Amen. is for every single person that's ever been born, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, going all the way back to the last person mm. that's going to walk on the face of this earth. Amen. He mm. paid the price. The question is, can you believe it? Yeah. Do you believe it? Yeah. Will you put your faith in the fact that Christ paid the price for you? Amen. And yeah. that is something that we can rejoice Woo. in because all we need to do is say, my faith is the fact that Christ paid the price for my sins. Yeah. And God says, listen, you do that. Mm -hmm. You believe that one simple thing about Christ. I'm going to give you something, a gift that will last forever. The gift of eternal life. Amen. So if you never trusted Christ as your Savior, can you think of any reason that would be worth not doing it today, right now? Yeah, that's a question you don't want to put off. Because you put it off and world and life gets busy. And it's just like, you know, Paul standing before, was it Felix? Oh, I'm going to consider this. Oh, it's a good thing. And we never, you never hear that, that he ever changed his mind, but do it right now. We pray you'll trust Christ and uh, get that free gift of eternal life. Um, uh, Ludus's family and Derek, Derek Patterson. Patterson. Yeah. Heavenly father, this morning, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to join together in our thinking and our speech as we consider the truths of your word and for the Amen. time that we spent thinking about how precious it is to even have your word in our, in, in our, not just in our hands, but that we are able to read and it becomes a part of us and, and it's in our, in our hearts and in our minds. And it, it, it drives what we understand about you. We thank you that we understand from your word that, that the ultimate commendation of your love was the gift of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the fellowship that we have in him, because we're justified together in him Amen. through that finished work on Calvary. We think of of Derek and, and Lourdes's family and, and and indeed probably everyone in our live chat has circumstances in their life. And, and we understand that circumstances don't always take us where we want us to go. But we know that wherever circumstances take us, we have the assurance of your grace and the assurance of your love and the, the assurance of of the power of your spirit and, and your son in our lives to, to bring power uh, to our circumstances, not so much to change the circumstances, but to live through them and to have peace and to have joy. Amen. Uh, and uh, we just, <laughs> we praise you for the, the, the assurance that we get Amen. Uh, from your, from the, from the word, uh, from the life of your son, Amen. for the commendation of your love, Amen. through the power of the spirit, that we might all bring forth the fruits of righteousness, which are by mm. Jesus Christ, that we would be living testimonies this day unto the amazing grace and love of God. And we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. the Lord. That was awesome. Uh, hey, uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Absolutely. Um, we will be back here Sunday morning. Pastor Hal is going to be talking. Freddie Bear is going to do an Easter message. It'll be totally, totally mm -hmm. epic.
Uh, Did so the have, angel in the tomb lie about Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a tough question. Uh, you guys have a bad weekend. I love you all dearly, and uh, we'll we'll see you on Sunday. Take Amen. care. Praise the Lord.